Good afternoon and welcome to the webinar. I am Dr. Abdul Ghafoor, the Managing Trustee of AMR Declaration Trust. Antimicrobial resistance is a global challenge. All countries, including India, are seriously affected by the AMR crisis. AMR Declaration Trust is a public charitable trust founded on the principles of Chennai Declaration. A Chennai Declaration is a document an initiative by medical societies in India with the support of various stakeholders. The document and initiative created significant momentum in our efforts to tackle AMR. We are confident that India can significantly contribute to the global efforts to tackle AMR, especially in providing innovative solutions. We have a highly efficient scientific community in the country and our Make in India vision to help us succeed in our mission. Our governmental organizations are doing an excellent work to tackle AMR. Our trust aims to support formal efforts by creating a platform where scientists and innovators can informally discuss their ideas. AMR is a global challenge and we need a collaborative and collective process to innovate. We believe our country can lead the innovation to tackle a global crisis. The webinar, our secret plans to tame the superbugs will discuss the challenge that we face at global and regional levels and how India can provide innovative solutions to the worldwide challenge. Today, we have highly reputed speakers, I would say the best in the world, who will discuss various aspects of AMR and the potential innovative solutions. It's impossible to get all these giants together on any day, especially when they live in different time zones. So, to maintain the uniformity, we decided to record all lectures. Let us listen to their talks, then we will collect the queries from the audience. Finally, we will send these queries to the respective speakers collect their answers and distribute them as a document to all the attendees. So please type in your queries in the chat box available in the login page. AMR Declaration Trust has minimal funds. We have received a small donation from doctors, including our trustees. However, our resource is not adequate to conduct academic activities. We decided not to charge any registration fee to spread the message to a broader audience. Hence, we have requested small and restricted conference grants from multiple pharmaceutical companies, including Cipla, Sanofi, Galangen, Converge, Biotech, and a few other companies. We have received small grants from two, and we hope we will receive small contributions from a few more. We have analyzed the content of the recorded lectures from all academic speakers and assessed for any potential conflicts of interest. The experts representing the startup industry working on innovations have openly disclosed their positions in the company. We express our gratitude to medical societies such as Indian Medical Association, Clinical Infectious Disease Society, Indian Society of Critical Care Medicine, Indian Association of Medical Microbiologists and Indian Academy of Pediatrics for endorsing the meeting. Friends, we have Professor Dame Sally Davis, a doyen in the field of AMR, who will deliver the first talk. Dame Sally is a UK AMR envoy and the former Chief Medical Advisor to UK government. So let us now listen to what Dame Sally has to say. Hello. I'm so sorry not to be there with you in person. But let me say to you that variant after variant, the COVID-19 pandemic has continued to wreak devastation on our societies and economies. Health security, food security and national security have been challenged at every level. Meanwhile, the United Nations has signalled a code red to humanity on climate change. Without antibiotics being effective and equitable and accessible, modern medicine, as we know, will just not be doable. At the same time, the overuse of antimicrobials is perpetuating the inequalities 
that got us into COVID-19 to begin with. Many of you will know that earlier this year, the world's first and most comprehensive estimates of the global burden of AMR to date were published in The Lancet, based on data from 204 countries and 471 million health records, it's clearer than ever that the world is facing an AMR pandemic. In 2019, over 1.2 million deaths were directly attributable to AMR, making bacterial AMR a bigger killer than HIV, TB or malaria and the 12th leading cause of death globally. And when we take into account deaths associated with AMR, there were almost 5 million globally over that year, which makes AMR the third most important leading underlying cause of death overall. And tragically, one in five deaths were in children aged under five. The new data on AMR has to be a wake-up call for the G7 to lead the way to ensure the development of therapies and vaccines, as well as diagnostics to steer and detect appropriate use. This needs to be accompanied by provisions for equitable and global access and rigorous stewardship. COVID-19 has taught us a great value in having treatments at work. Yet as it stands, the WHO have gone so far as to say the world is failing on AMR because the lack of treatments in development that will fill critical public health needs, then are just not there. The global scientific community was able to develop COVID-19 vaccines rapidly because they were built on years of earlier investment and research. To address AMR, research is happening, but the antibiotic market is so broken that only five of 12 antibiotic companies that went public over the last decade are still alive and active. Antibiotics, we know, they're critical infrastructure which healthcare systems across the world depend on to be effective. But with only two antibiotics, for instance, in the whole pipeline, active against the critical multi-drug resistant gram-negative bacteria, our global medicine cabinets are running on empty. Furthermore, if the antibiotics can't be accessed, then they're not effective. And this, in turn, depends on their invention, development and validation through research, but also their regulatory approval, manufacturing and equitable distribution. We live in a cycle where, sadly, AMR drives inequality and where inequality breeds AMR. Global demand for antibiotics is high and increasing, having almost doubled between 2004 and 2018. But our valuation and payments for these drugs is at an all-time low, with the proliferation of generics driving a race to the bottom in pricing. As a result, the financial and societal and also the environmental value of antibiotics has plummeted. Less than half of the new chemical entities developed between 1999 and 2014 were even available in more than 10 countries, including in some G7 countries where they didn't have access. As it stands, the weak market and lack of access leads the public paying through premature deaths, expensive treatments or higher taxes for our collective inability to anticipate or act on the risks. So the benefits of coordinated action on AMR are clear. AMR is not a pandemic of the future. It's here now and it's accelerating. It's growing at a faster pace than we're innovating or enabling access to antimicrobials. Staying one step ahead of superbugs requires global leadership, not only from the G7, but the G20 and the G77, with health and more importantly, actually, finance ministers leveraging the investments and approaches we need for COVID-19. I spent much of last year working with G7 countries to improve the market conditions for antibiotic development. I challenged health ministers to work with finance ministers to take the current lack of innovation for novel antimicrobials seriously. Our G7 finance ministers made commitments to address AMR for the first time ever 
showing that tackling AMR is integral to current and future health and economic prosperity. They emphasise the role of pull incentives that could be piloted across their economies and health systems, designed to ensure a sustainable pipeline of new and equitably accessible antimicrobials. We are driving forward progress that's already starting to be made across G7 countries. In the UK, our innovative Netflix model is a world-first system to pay for antibiotics by subscription, based on their value to society, not on the volume of pills sold. Earlier this year, the UK's National Institute for Health and Care Excellence published draft guidance estimating the value of pilot drugs from Shinogi and Pfizer. This then informed commercial contracts for delinked payments based on the subscription scheme to these companies. The contracts are signed and payments are being made, capped at £10 million each year. This shows that such a model is feasible. It works for companies, patients as well, the important bit, and governments. We can also look to Germany's reimbursement incentive with value-based pricing for new antibiotics. And we hope Japan will build on its special pricing um, system to develop a subscription model too. With the Pasteur Act in the US ready to establish a subscription model and the EU, EU committed to similar as early as this year, these schemes will collectively give a meaningful incentive for investing in antibiotic research and development. We now need to hold each other to account and get these promised pilots up and running and evaluated. Only then will the G7 level, the R&D playing field and the G20 join in so that it makes as much sense for companies to develop a new antimicrobial treatment as it would to pursue a new cancer therapy. This will help us to grow the global marketplace for antibiotics and level up access while, I believe, avoiding excess use. To support this, G7 health ministers committed to pay for antibiotics in ways that reflect the benefits they bring to the health system. This will need to be underpinned by data and evidence now and in the future on antimicrobial use and antimicrobial resistance to guide our innovation to target the most dangerous and priority pathogens and unmet national health needs. I'm delighted that Germany are now accelerating this work through their G7 presidency so that the G7's efforts can achieve a meaningful incentive for global investment and put meaningful provisions in place for equitable access. Together, we can value and celebrate antibiotics as a backbone of modern healthcare systems. As we look forward, it is up to the current and next G7 presidencies to set firm milestones for delivery, and we need to continue the momentum of joint collaboration between finance and health tracks setting the tone and the bar, actually, for the G20's Joint Finance Health Task Force. We should also look at how other multilateral mechanisms could facilitate needs-driven antibiotic R&D and provide for equitable access. One of the mechanisms we can do this through is the pandemic treaty or legal instrument that countries are currently negotiating through the WHO. The significant overlap between the strategies needed to address pandemics and AMR. Through the Global Leaders Group on AMR of the UN, we are advocating for any instrument to be grounded in a One Health approach to enable meaningful and proactively coordinated multi-sectoral governance, infrastructure and architecture. The GLG seeks for any pandemic instrument to integrate AMR alongside its primary focus on other new pandemics. This is feasible with only small tweaks or changes to pandemic strategies. One Health surveillance has to be at the heart of any treaty to enable rapid, transparent and responsive detection of any new viral or bacterial threats, regardless of the pandemic source. And strong surveillance systems that can pivot will benefit not only AMR, but full pandemic preparedness. We need to recognise and designate antimicrobials as the global public goods 
that they are and create trusted mechanisms for ex expediting their development. The likes of CEPI, Carbex and Guard P can all play a role here. We also need to consider how to ensure regulatory harmonisation and support for manufacturing hubs so the entire value chain from research, development, procurement and distribution works. Of course, we can learn from COVAX and we can look to the nascent secure project for a way to pool demand and supply for low and middle income countries. The way forward has to be not only innovation but collaboration to deliver for people. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dame Sally, for the wonderful overview on the global scenario of antimicrobial resistance. Now we will have a, a short panel discussion and we have Dr. Jailal, he's a very senior functionary of Indian Medical Association and he's also the advisor to the AMR Declaration Trust. And also we have Dr. J.P.S. Gill, and he's, he's a very famous veterinary AMR expert, and he's the director in, in Guru Angad Dev Veterinary University. Dr. Jailal, you are one of the co-authors of Chennai Declaration. We have worked on, all of us have worked on various aspects of AMR. Now, we need innovation, we need new molecules, we need diagnostics, and India has a scientific skill. How can our country be a leader in innovations to tackle antimicrobial resistance? Dr. Jalal, you're not audible. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Uh, Dr. Kabur. On behalf of Indian Medical Association and the Commonwealth Medical Association, I would like to congratulate you for taking up this very, very needed step in the AMR. I'm so happy that uh, uh, various countries are coming forward to do something actively. India is also playing a major role in uh, curtailing this AMR menace in our country. We believe that this is going to help us in the establishing the health and economy. The first and foremost, what we have learned from the COVID is the inbuilt environment technology where we feel that uh, the environmental or inbuilt position like uh, cross air ventilation inside the OP, then the restricting the number of people, wearing the mask, avoiding the, the mask gathering and uh, the hand hygiene. And these all the inbuilt technology where our aim, first aim is to, to reduce the burden of the source of infection. So this now India is establishing, including the private public health hospitals, where there is new look is given for the inbuilt environment. The next and the foremost one, which we are emphasizing on the One Health approach, very recently the National Institute of uh, Veterinary Medicine Technology in Hyderabad has established the consortium of One Health comprising nearly 27 organizations to look into the One Health approach to reduce the burden and early detection and identification of the, the, the uh, AMR menace in our country. And we are uh, going ahead in the spirit in the One Health approach. The third opportunity which we are using is the is sparking antibiotic uh, uh, discovery because now we are focusing on instead of the protein, high molecular or the heavy molecular weight, the nano molecular parts, how we will be able to utilize, especially with the escape bacteria. There's a super bug bacteria. Now there are a lot of innovation technologies on the nanotechnology. That's Indian, uh, uh, our government is concentrating on nanotechnology to help in the antibiotic, uh, new antibiotic drugs or the patent to be identified and where we will be able to do something uh, very proactively role. The shared opportunities or the shared platform for the antibiotic research, we have rich sources of vaccine production. Similarly, we have a rich production of the pharmaceutical industry and integration of these pharmaceutical industries to look into the a shared platform opportunity to produce the new antibiotic formulations there. The most importantly, now we are looking at an integrated approach where we are now looking that not only are looking with the modern medicine approach, but also from the, the, the ancient traditional medicinal system, which is available in India, how best we will be able to learn from them, how best we will be able to utilize that drugs or the molecules which are available to be utilized properly to the uh, uh, foremost countries or foremost situations is an approach which you are doing. But the, what, the main concentration we are doing is making sure the antibiotic stewardship is established 
the rational drug therapy is established the crossopathy or the the over the counter sales drugs is curtailed and the people are oriented even our medical fraternity is oriented towards the antibiotic abuse antibiotic complications and the ways and means how we will be able to train so we uh, indian medical association will be wholly fully participating in the initiatives of indian uh, government of india and uh, people like kafor when they are taking that action i wish all the best and we hope that we will be able to make some concrete uh, contribution in an uh, innovations in the control of amr in our country thank you dr jayalal you know very very you know comprehensive and overview of what indian medical association other medical societies can contribute to the innovation stimulating the innovations uh, dr jps gill you are a well known expert in the field of veterinary amr and what's your opinion how can our country contribute from an innovation perspective in the veterinary amr side and of course is one health approach is not just human or veterinary is one health against amr thank you i am audible yes yes yeah. dr gill yeah. thank you for inviting me for this important webinar so with the growing recognition of the complexity of amr we need urgently to set up response to this emerging health emergency in a collective manner in a one health approach so the focus area should be, uh, be the amr related therapeutics vaccine development rapid screening and diagnostics and surveillance so in we are mainly working on the new treatment options there are there is need to develop new treatment options supporting the search on uh, new drug molecules and targets the most promising alternatives are antimicrobial proteins uh, in animal sciences or uh, veterinary sciences we are working on the bacteriophages and we have got very good results on it bacteriocins we are also working on the prebiotics and the probiotics and mainly the herbal based substances that the plant based drugs so a good center has been ayush has established a good center for in the veterinary sciences for the these type of the products so there is also a search of new antibiotics in which that just like dr jalal has told that nanotechnology has revolutionized the treatment of drug resistant infection especially the nano silver which is commercially nano material for antibacterial properties so we the second aspect in this is we should need to work on nano drug delivery which because the just like in the most of the uh, livestock disease we need a very large dose of antibiotics but if we use a nano drug delivery system it will target just like in brucellosis to the simply the macrophage very little amount of drug can be used is required then there is need to develop a uh antibiotic resistant breaker to restore the efficacy of the old antibiotics uh these, these are the mainly the anti resistance drugs or the novel adjuvants for the antibiotic compounds to stave off bacterial resistance need to work on the class innovation on the class of the compounds like beta lactamase inhibitors efflux pump inhibitors and outer membrane permeables we we are working on our scientists are working on these things then there is further need of antivirulence drugs which are the target uh, which target the gene products especially for which are essential for the uh, bacterial survival and target can be can be quorum sensing inhibitors bacterial toxin inhibitors so in veterinary we give the are giving more emphasis on the vaccine development just like the majority of the drugs is consumed in the mastitis treatment so we are working on the tre vaccine treatment of the development of the vaccine in poultry which is a big guzzler of the antibiotics as the uh, growth promoter the vaccines on the e coli and salmonella we need to work on and if we were, are uh, successful in this vaccine development uh, almost we can say one third of the drug use in the livestock it can be eliminated in that on the diagnostic fronts there is very very essential need of rapid and specific diagnostics for reducing unnecessary prescriptions so there is need to develop design a diagnostic tools and the improvement of such facilities would encourage simultaneously with other measures uh, in the veterinary we are working on the pen side diagnosis we need to st strengthen our diagnostic facilities with the uh 
pen side, we which in the our annual spend, we say that at the farm which can be used or at the which at the small hospitals, just like a rapid test using microfluidic platform or micro scale assay that need uh, provide the integrated function of minimum steps need to be designed to replace the conventional bench top sample preparation. So and the molecular techniques like fish that the fluorescent in situ vibration, we are developing various kits and we are working on it for its validation. The major work uh, thing is that the funding, the to develop new molecules, new drugs, or the new diagnostics, the academic institutions are not getting enough funding. So the on the other side, the industry has the funding, but not that they have to recruit the new uh, scientists for the R&D. If academia and industry join together for development of new molecules and new diagnostics, in India, it will be a very, very good situation in both the both for the academicians, industries, and we can combat this AMR very effectively on the field level. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. JPS Gill, for, for explaining to us what happened in the field, what should be what should be happening, what research we should be doing. Before going on, going on to the next session, I would like to have Dr. Jaila's opinion. We, we doctors see the patients with multi-drug resistant bacteria and scientists develop the molecule. How can we help our scientists by raising a momentum, by convincing policymakers on the need to support our startups? How can medical associations and clinicians work on it? Yeah, now the government normally understand only in the language of economic values. They do not talk in the language of a disease or not. And if we can have a data to be collected and by doing an AMR and how much an economic, uh, the, the importance or the impact it is going to create and provide that to the government and the possibility of the government allocating the budget for that can be increased. Unfortunately, in spite of all of our efforts, the budget allocation in the uh, for the health in the budgets is always dissimilarly poor. But when more and more data we collect together and when we are submitting and uh, explaining in terms of the economic language or in terms of monetary values, I think the government will be able to do that. And till then, and it is must be a mandatory system should be created. Now, if we are uh, talking with an NMC or talking with the health ministry, now so much of uh, medical students are coming, nearly you know, one lakh medical students. And if there is can be a like in a, in a court when they are going, they are putting a stamp for every case which you are putting. And like this is being a, an important issue if we can understand either a, a separate a taxation system or the medical students has to contribute to the medical system. Somebody is coming for that has to contribute even a small amount, just starting from a 10 rupees or a 20 rupees if they start, uh, that will be able to be a great funding source. Only thing we need to convince the government on the importance of that, then the effect will be more for us. That's a good suggestion, Dr. Jalal. You have mentioned that we need better healthcare funding. And Dr. Jalal also given a, a solution as well, how to, how to get more income to the government so that government can make that uh, spending. Uh, thanks a lot, Dr. Jalal and Dr. JPS Gill for a wonderful panel discussion. And now we will move on to the next session. And Dr. Vasam Nagwekar, one of our trustees and a leading infectious disease consultant in Mumbai, will chair the next session. Dr. Nagwekar, over to you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity. Uh, look, um, it's a great pleasure to invite Dr. Renu Swaroop, who has been a former secretary of the Department of Biotechnology India. And Dr. Swaroop will brief us on how to stimulate innovations to tackle antimicrobial resistance and Indian perspective. A very good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on which part of the world you are joining in. I would like to compliment the organizers for having this very wonderful webinar on taming the superbugs. And I think taming the superbugs is really uh, we need to look at it as one health approach. Today, when we talk about AMR, today, when we talk about the superbugs, the resistance that it has caused, we feel that it's a phenomena that we've been discussing for the last few years, but this is something which has been there for many, many years. In fact, it's important to bring here a point that even Alexander Fleming, 
Nobel laureate in 1945 had said when he sort of invented penicillin, said the time will come when penicillin can be bought by anyone in the shops. But we have to remember at that point of time, he said, quote, then there is the danger that the ignorant man may easily underdose himself and by exposing his microbes to the non-lethal quantities of the drug could make them resistant. Today, we are at a situation where it's not underdosing, it's overdosing. And I think what we have really done is we've exposed all the microbes, all the, the small pool of antibiotics that we have, and we've made everything resistant. Now, this AMR has been very, very correctly termed as the silent pandemic. Today, not just the scientists, not just the researchers, the doctors, the healthcare workers, but the citizens at large, the public at large, understands challenges, the public health challenges, what a pandemic can bring to them. And it's important now, at this point of time, that we communicate that AMR or the whole One Health approach is truly a silent pandemic. We have faced the worst pandemic anyone would, but having faced all the problems with that, we have also witnessed the strength of collaborations, the strength of the science-based innovations which have come forward in fighting this war against the, the virus, against the pandemic. This learning that we have from COVID is so very important because this has now given us the understanding of the importance of communication, the importance of collaboration, the importance of convergence. We saw all that in the pandemic. And I think what we really need to do and what is going to be our secret plan to fight and tame this uh, super bug is to do exactly that. We need to have now very clear action plans on how would we and what strategies on how would we tackle this major global threat? How would we mitigate the risks which have been associated with it? And it's so important because unless and until we mitigate this risk, unless we uh, develop strategies to handle this, we are going to be faced by much more serious threat. And this threat is not just a threat on humans, but it's humans, it's animals, it's, it's the environment at large, it's, it's the overall health of our society, which directly impacts the economies of the world. And I think that's why correctly, even WHO has listed it, AMR in their top um, 10, I think, uh, problems. Now, the issue is to a group such as yours, it's not important to say what are going to be the problems with One Health and AMR, but what really are those solutions that we need to take forward? The data that we see, alarming data that we see, whether it's from the WHO report or the Lancet review, it is enough for everyone to get energized, to be able to develop that global mission with a common objective, a common goal. Even the WHO in, had, in fact, in um, 2015, got their global action plan. And then, then um, governments, world over were asked to prepare their national action plans. We have done that. India has a good national action plan, which we put into place from 2017 to 21. We are now looking at um, the action plan 22 onwards. But it's not just about having an action plan. It's how do you implement that action plan? What's your roadmap? In India, we have a well-developed governance framework to ensure that it's done. We have six uh, strategic priorities uh, from surveillance to awareness, to reducing the incidence of infection, to optimizing the use of antibiotics, and most importantly, promoting research, development, 
and also promoting India's leadership. Now, coming specifically to the research and development, because that is an area which I've been closely associated with for many, many years in my over 33 years in the Department of Biotechnology, working with DBT, working with BIRAC, working with the researchers in the academia, our startups, our industry, I can say one thing. We have a lot of competence. We have a lot of, we have this very vibrant, robust ecosystem. Now it's important, how do we use this for being able to meet the targets and goals that we put out for, um, for uh, AMR, for One Health. Uh, many of the national missions which the government has set up, uh, be it the Swachh Bharat mission, be it our digital health mission, Ayushman Bharat, our TB eradication mission, are in some way connected to this One Health AMR mission. We have missions on the animal health, we have the whole brucellosis um, uh, mission, we have the foot and mouth disease mission for uh, the animal husbandry department. Each one of them is looking at the surveillance, it is looking at the diagnostic, it is looking at the disease management, it's looking at uh, treatments, vaccines. But right now, we have these different groups who are sitting and working on them. It's important for us to connect the dots. And these dots need to be connected to be able to deliver the final objective. And what we need to do now is to do it with a much more greater sense of urgency, and with a sense of commitment to be able to deliver. As I said, for any of these national action plans, surveillance has to be our first action point. Uh, we know that for COVID, if we were able to move forward, it was our testing, our tracking, our treatment, this whole um, strategy that we followed. And for AMR, again, it's the surveillance which is so important. We have porous borders. We have transboundary movement of pathogens. It's important now to set up these regional surveillance networks, especially on the border areas where we see more movement of pathogens and, um, and the, you know, the transboundary movement of the pathogens. We have the tools for it, but I think we need more innovation now to be able to develop very, very important diagnostic methods for it. Again, I refer to the COVID. From sewage surveillance to um, testing and diagnostic of pool sample analysis to our genomic uh, surveillance that we've done, our genomic analysis. Each one of them was so important for us to keep our eyes on the pathogen. We need something similar here. We have many groups who've come up within the research community, be it startups, be it uh, industry, academia, of course. We need to now channelize their energies, channelize their understanding to be able to collectively respond to creating a very strong product portfolio of new diagnostics, new surveillance mechanisms, new surveillance methodologies. Similarly, we also now need to move forward in terms of our um, vaccines, in terms of our therapeutics, especially the antibiotics. It's interesting to see that for so many years, we really do not have a new antibiotic. We've not had a new drug that has come forward, but we've created these platforms, the platform technologies for vaccines, a large number of uh, screening libraries, et cetera. Let's now start mobilizing that effort for, for um, AMR, for One Health. Again, here, one thing that we saw when we fought our uh, COVID war was each group had to really communicate with the other. The researchers could not do anything in isolation. It was all stakeholders. It was cohorts that we created of the researchers, the clinicians, the healthcare workers, because that's where we understand the needs. That's where the researchers start developing newer innovations and they get validated by the clinicians to be able to then be delivered for um, healthcare purposes. And I think that that framework that we've been able to develop from research to translation to clinical validation, and then taking it to the market, taking it to the users, that partnership, that, that mechanism of working together 
has to be now brought in for the One Health approach. And here it makes it even more complex because you have to bring in the human angle, you have to bring in the, um, the animal health, as I said, the plants, the environment, and climate change today is again an area which is center staged. But as this has to be connected to the One Health approach, and that's how we'll be able to move forward. I think this urgent need that we have to respond to this growing challenge to ensure that we have the proper and appropriate strategies to address these interconnected disease management issues to deliver uh, the desired public health outcomes is something that we need to take forward with a very well articulated uh, roadmap. Today, we are seeing increasingly the, the data that is coming in, which is giving us uh, the analysis, which is telling us where we are. But I think we still need to do more for data generation. If there have to be policy uh, changes, if there have to be policy interventions, either in terms of how we implement our action plan for uh, AMR, or how do we promote our innovations for new solutions that we bring in, or how do we actually bringing changes into our whole healthcare delivery systems, we need data. It has to be a scientific data-driven uh, you know, evidence that we have, which will drive our policy changes. And I think that data generation is very important. We have a number of groups who've taken up these activities, but again, data sharing is something that is not so easily done by all of us. So we have to work together to be able to do that. So it's important that we keep our focus on the on the center point that we have, and that is the whole One Health AMR issue. But make sure that we have the right policy framework. And for this, especially if you have to look at new innovations, we have to invest in high risk research. We have to invest in trying to see how we take this research through this framework that I just spoke about, connecting the basic translational research with the clinical research and implementation research is very, very important. We have to remember one thing that today, where we are positioned in India, we are one of, we are positioned very highly in our innovation index. We have uh, one of the largest or the most growing startup ecosystem in our country. Our foundations of research are very strong, but we have to continuously fuel this innovation pipeline and create that framework that can take these products, as I said, for giving us the solutions for this public health challenge that we need to address. But while we are talking about it being India-centric or country-centric, we have to remember that if it's One Health, it's One World. So it has to be a global One Health AMR consortia that we all talk about global access to resources, shared infrastructure, globally accessible repositories, giving us proper tools and instruments which allow research data to be shared across the ecosystem. We've learned with COVID, but I think we need to now implement it for, for newer models such as this as well. The last point that I would like to highlight is that while we are creating this very enabling framework, it's very important for us to see that we <clears throat> bring in capacities. Because at some point of time, we will realize that our teams who are working on this are not sufficiently geared up in numbers. So we do need to continuously keep building capacities and that training has to be a very, very important aspect. And that training would be from researchers, to our advocacy groups, to our uh, public health workers, to our health workers, to our policy makers, to everyone. And unless we continue this in the form of a very, very good communication strategy, it's not going to be easy for us to take it ahead. Similarly, like in other disease management models, One Health and EMR also has to be a PPP driven model where each component of the public-private partnership model has to collectively work together. And here, when we say PPP, we have to remember one thing, that it has to be the 
public, private, but it also has to be the people, and that is the citizens who have to work together. We must remember one thing, that the solutions that we develop for COVID are going to come handy for AMR. But how is that going to happen? How are you going to make sure that the data and the in the framework that you created is going to be um, available for AMR is only when you center stage this. With today, AMR is center staged in mostly all our policy decisions, whether it's G7, whether it's G20, or any of these. But having a global consortia, having a globally uh, identified roadmap will help innovations to move across borders. Our incubation network that we have today, uh, our product development network today is not just for India. It's not just for, it's for India and the developing world. We have innovations that we develop in India, but we test them across the borders. And I think that's exactly what we need to do when we talk about this One Health issue. So I would like to conclude by once again saying, yes, we can tame these superbugs. It's important to see how well our roadmap can overcome the strategy. So thank you all the best and have a wonderful discussion. And I hope a very good uh, recommendation comes through this uh, to be able to globally develop this roadmap. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Renu Soluk for providing us an excellent bird's eye view on what India is doing and planning to do to stimulate the innovation to tackle the antimicrobial resistance. For this session, Dr. Rajiv Jaydevan has been the chairperson, and he will be shortly onto the panel. Now I request Dr. I, I would uh, ask Dr. Rajiv Jaydevan, who has been a scientific committee in charge, IMA Kerala, and a huge big TV personality. Dr. Rajiv, sir, I just wanted to ask you a question. How can India stimulate innovation to tackle this antimicrobial resistant problem which the discussion has been going on? Dr. Rajiv Jaydev. Thank you. We know from the uh, our own country's work, there is ICMR who just published the AMR data uh, after analyzing around 100,000 culture samples. We know from the Lancet report uh, that was uh, published um, in September by Chris Murray and, and, and team from the IHME. Uh, we know that there's a problem. We know that there's a problem and that's, that's the reason why uh, the AMR Declaration Trust, Trust is um, running a um, fantastic webinar here with speakers from around the world. Now, what I have to ask uh, is the following in answer to your question. Uh, there's something called the seminar paradox. The seminar paradox basically says that uh, those who attend the seminar are the ones who least need it. In other words, the people who need the seminar are always outside the room. So uh, when we look at the AMR, it's a multifaceted problem. Uh, it has uh, doctors involved, it has healthcare workers, other healthcare workers, has, it has uh, uh, the community involved, uh, it has communication teams involved. Uh, so it's a, it's a very large community that we need to engage from uh, within the four walls of our um, webinar. So the question is, how well do we reach, uh, how well do we communicate these messages from our webinar to the community? Now, Dr. Reno Swarup used the word communication twice in her address, and I, I was carefully uh, listening to her, to her talk. Uh, India countered COVID-19 very well, not simply through developing vaccines and um, through uh, having good doctors and nurses, uh, but it was through good communication and also assertive uh, decision-making early, at the early stages and communicating facts in a, in a way that everybody can understand. And that uh, I believe that communication is really what helped India um, minimize the damage from the pandemic. So likewise, communication plays a major role in actually implementing uh, these solutions on the ground. Because in a seminar, we can say all we want. We all know that AMR is a problem, but what really matters is uh, what um, Dr. Dufour often refers to as the butterfly effect. That is, you could, you could have a small um, problem in one area of the world, which can actually translate to a much larger problem in other parts of the world. And the reverse also is true. If we create a wave of change in a small part, like in our own room here, in our webinar, um, provided the right conditions are delivered, uh, we, can, uh, we can implement large changes. 
Now, I will share here uh, my experience with road safety uh, to uh, draw a parallel here. Uh, I work on numerous public health topics, and one of them is uh, that so many people die of road accidents and they get injured in India. Uh, in my own state of Kerala, 36,000 people are grievously injured and 4,000 people die every year in, on our roads. So uh, when we talk about road safety, uh, most people have a great opinion about themselves. They all think that they are very, very good at using the road. That's, that applies to all of us. And that's the first barrier that I encountered in my work. But when I converted the evidence and the data into action points, like for example, you must not walk at night wearing dark clothes. You must never turn your vehicle on without turning your lights on at night. You must never use the road to make up lost time. Plan your day well so that you, ad you do adequate budgeting for your trip. Now, these are easy action points which translate into outcomes. Now, we need to convert each one of these data points into translatable outcomes, not only for doctors, but for the community as well. So that is a challenge ahead. I'm sure Dr. Gafur and his team will take care of that and I will help you uh, convert that into action points. So I also listened to um, Dr. Sally Davies and she used a couple of phrases here. She said, our cabinets are running empty. And she also said, we need to have coordinated action. I think both these are very powerful uh, terms uh, and uh, they do mean a lot. And um, uh, I will stop now. And I'll also thank uh, Dr. Kufur for inviting and uh, Dr. Vasant uh, Navgekar uh, for uh, chairing the session and uh, wish you all the very best. Thank you, Dr. Raji, for your valuable comments. And uh, we will have a panel discussion. And this one is going to be the most interesting session of the webinar. And may I invite Dr. Gafur sir again to take over the session and chair the session. So, uh, Gafur sir, all to you. Over. Thank you, Dr. Vasan Nagwekar. We all know we have a dry antibiotic pipeline and we need new antibiotics, molecules, and diagnostics. We have excellent Indian brains and teams working hard to provide us these options. We will now have a fireside chat with four leading innovators in our country. Now we have a panel discussion with very famous innovators from our country. As clinicians, we are all facing the lack of antibiotics, the lack of new rapid diagnostics that can help our patients. But we need innovators because they give us molecules, they give us the technology, they give us the diagnostics. At the same time, the work they do is not that easy. They don't have a flowery path. And here our innovators from our country will tell us what challenges they face and what support they need from us, the doctors, and from authorities. And we have got four reputed experts as panelists. We have Dr. Bal Ganesh. He's a CEO of Gangajan. It's a startup company mainly working on bacteriophages. Then we have Dr. Anand Anand Kumar. He's a CEO of Bug works, probably the only Indian startup working on new antibiotic, new promising antibiotics. We have got Dr. Radha Rangarajan. She's the director of the CSIR CDRI in Lucknow. She recently joined as the director of the institution. And before that, she has got enormous experience as a scientist, as a scientist who developed drugs and diagnostics. We have Dr. Taslim Arif, he's the CEO of CCAM, and CCAM is a very reputed institution in Bangalore who have done amazing work in supporting scientists in developing molecules and diagnostics, not just in medicine from other fields as well. We have Dr. Neha Gupta, she's a clinician, she's an infectious disease doctor like me, and Neha works in the Fortis Memorial Hospital in Delhi, and myself and Neha, we experience the drug resistance problem on a day-to-day -day basis. Dr. Neha, as an infectious disease clinician, treating drug resistant infections on a day-to-day -day basis, what's your experience? What's your challenge in managing these drug resistant infections in your hospital? 
So, um, greetings to everybody. And uh, I first of all congratulate uh, Dr. Gafood for organizing this. And at the same time, it's a pleasure being here. So, when we talk about drug resistance, as we all know that for long, antibiotics have been the bedrock of modern medicine. We have been able to do the complicated surgeries, perform complicated procedures, implant-related surgeries, arthroplasties, because we were able to treat or manage infections. But off late, because of the increasing antimicrobial resistance, these are becoming increasingly difficult to manage. So um, as an ID physician, I think when we go... As an ID physician, we manage most complicated infections across the various specialties because most of the specialties they manage initially, but when they see a drug resistant bug or a very complicated infection, an ID reference is sought for. And off late, we are seeing an increasing, like since even uh, it's just creeping up. In fact, if you look at objectively, the ICMR data also suggests that the infections across the various anterior bacteria, say, as well as the other gram negative bugs like Pseudomonas and Acinetobacter, are creeping up. And they're very, very limited options. So the E. coli susceptibility to carbapenems has actually dropped down from close to 80% to 60%. And in fact, Klebsiella pneumoniae, which is one of the most common infections in the ICU, the susceptibility to that has dropped again from 60 to 40 percent and in certain centers it's hardly 20 percent so a lot of times we have really don't have any treatment options left and at this point then it becomes extremely we really need some new molecules new uh, new um, antibiotics which can uh, to control such infections yeah, I completely agree with you. Just like you, you know, we practice the same specialty. I was just observing. I haven't put my mobile off. It's just in the silent mode. Though I am moderating a panel discussion. Dr. Neha could not put her mobile off. You know the reason? We get calls all the time from intensive care unit, from bone marrow transplant unit. This patient is crashing, doc, which antibiotic I should give? Which antifungal I should give? And we are facing a, a difficult scenario that cholestin is resistant, saftazinavipactam is resistant, astrionam synergy not working. I'm sorry, you just continue the same antibiotic. I don't have a, an antibiotic to give uh, to treat an extensively drug resistant bacteria. That's the scenario. That's why we need help from the scientists. And we are wonderful scientists from you. And we need you to help us to manage our patients. Dr. Balganesh, you are probably one company in the country who is working on, uh, mainly working on bacteriophages. Few years ago, you know, I went to Moscow to Peragov University to give a talk on AMR. And I was talking about the work that we do on antibiotics. And the scientists from Peragov were talking on randomized control trials of injecting bacteriophage into blood to treat Klebsiella infection. I've never seen that work. I never heard of it in India. They're talking about randomized control trials. And we need you to tell us on bacteriophages. It's, it's, it's an amazing uh, work. And we need your experience on bacteriophages and what you are doing to help us doctors. Uh, first and foremost, uh, Dr. Gafu, thank you for uh, this panel discussion. Am I audible? Yes, sir. OK, thank you. Uh, just on a background, I've spent uh, most of my time working on small molecules, and I've been working on phages of late, but uh, that's beside the point. I am working on bacteria, or we are working on bacteria. So you go back when Gangajan started. It's very interesting to think about it. This was 2000, and we started looking at uh, phages for the treatment of staph, basically MRSA at that point. And if you'll all remember, MRSA in 2000 was a doomsday prediction. You Imitzlin resistant means you didn't have anything else coming in. And the biggest issue at that point was uh, if we developed phages, and then we started talking to regulators. Regulators were clueless in terms of how are we going to deal with uh, phages because basically phages are proteins, multimers, 
they multiply within the system. I mean, the background about phages are basically they're viruses which attack bacteria and uh, kill or lyse the bacteria. And they are naturally present uh, in the uh, environment. Millions of phages are present in the environment. So it's even FDA recognizes those as the grass or generally accepted as safe. But the phage challenge was at the regulatory level. Phages carry DNA, so you're introducing foreign DNA into the system. Phages are proteins, so you will have immunological reaction. Remember, this is the pre-monoclonal period. And so it was a huge issue of that. And lastly, how do you do pharmacokinetics with, uh, with phages? They go in and they increase. So what's your predictive dose going to be? So have you overcome all these three problems? I don't think so. Even today, these are black boxes that we are dealing with. But the second problem, I think, in terms of protein, uh, thanks to monoclonals, we have uh, staying in more acceptance of protein therapeutics. Now, answering the from a perspective of what uh, Dr. Gupta spoke or what you raised, is this the answer? to the EMR question. I, I, I don't know whether to say yes or no. All I can say at this point is that this is an age old effective, uh, what shall I, therapeutic option, which has been completely superseded because of the chemical industry, basically uh, making uh, chemical molecules seem so much simpler, that we have solved a lot of problems at the chemical industry to which this seems so much harder. But I think it's time to re revisit it, not only from using bacteriophages, but also looking at uh, biotherapeutics or proteins as possible antibacterials. So uh, from my perspective, it could be very much an answer to AMR, but we've got some distance to go before we can say, yes, it's ready to do it. So yes, there's a light, but the light is still at the end of the tunnel. Back to you, Dr. Dufu. Thank you, Dr. Balganesh. So we are, we need, we need bacteriophages. We know what Russians are doing and probably French are doing, you know, better than me, what other countries do. And, and uh, how can we reach their level of development? So uh, just, uh, for your in, just for your information, Dr. Dufu, sorry for interrupting you. There is a company in Delhi sitting today who if uh, they deal with it on individual patients, and I can send you the details, who imports phages from Georgia and treats them in India. Okay, so that is clear. We may have lost Dr. Balganesh. Sure uh, we'll come back to Dr. Balganesh. Anand? You are the CEO of Bugworks and you are developing, I know you are developing an amazing antibiotic I'm looking forward. And what has been your experience? You know, what's your work on with these promising molecules? Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Kafur, for pulling together such an outstanding panel. Um, so I, just for the audience, I want to start with some sobering facts, even for clinicians. Uh, the Lancet study that was published in February of this year said that 1.3 million deaths directly and 5 million deaths indirectly to AMR. The numbers severely undercounted India because Dr. Kamini Valia and her fantastic team at ICMR published an article just 30, 40 days ago that said probably 700,000 deaths in India owing to AMR itself. We don't properly account for it. We may call it multi-organ death or come under some other nomenclature. But Dr. Gafur, you see this day to day. Dr. Gupta, I'm sure you see it day to day. This is spreading. It doesn't have the dynamic peaks and valleys of, uh, of COVID, but it's happening and it's really impacting our ability to practice modern medicine like, like the doctor shared here. And Dr. Gafu, just to, for your audience, Bugworks was started in 2014, 2015. We spun it out of my previous company called Cellworks. I'm a semiconductor physicist, hardly know the, knew the spelling of microbiology, still know very little about it. I was very fortunate that we got access to a fantastic team out of AstraZeneca, Bangalore. And for your audience, I must say this, that three people 
responsible for bug works in direct and indirect ways are in this call. Radha was the only company, Vitus Pharma, that bothered to work on antibiotics when nobody would touch it. So it was quite inspiring to see Radha and the team trying to do something so difficult. Tasleem, CCAM, is where Bugworks is based out of from day zero. And Dr. Balaganesh's team is the team that works with me today in Bugworks. So it's very interesting when I saw your panelists today, Dr. Gafu, that these are the folks that came to make Bugworks happen. So what is Bugworks? There are about 25, 30 people sitting in Bangalore. We work with worldwide I brought in a lot of semiconductor physics and mathematics and electrical engineering simulation modeling and married that with clinical pharmacology, microbiology, et cetera, to model, simulate efflux pumps and come out with new medicinal chemistry that can potentially avoid or be invisible to efflux pump. What does this mean? We've been able to come out with a full family of broad spectrum antibiotics. If successful, and it's still a big if because we have to pass clinical trials. If successful, Dr. Gafu, You'll be happy to know that this could be the first true broad spectrum after the fluoroquinolones of 1962. That it covers all gram positives, gram negatives, uh, phenomenal activity against the non fermenters and gram negatives, um, anaerobes, as well as bioterrorism pathogens. True full broad spectrum, except for NTM, non tuberculosis mycobacterium, we cover everything. Right? Very potent. Our worst MIC would be two. Most MICs are very much sub below one. So, very potent. IV with the oral step down, dual target. So we have not been able to generate resistance mutants around the world. That doesn't mean bacteria will not defeat us. They will defeat us. But if you have dual target, it can be almost as good as how the fluoroquinone launch was. We are going through clinical trials, Dr. Gafur, in Australia, uh, painfully expensive, painfully complex clinical trials for phase one. If phase one succeeds in 2023, we will start a phase two. This drug can be used for everything from HAPWAP, which is why we really want this drug for hospital acquired pneumonia and ventilator acquired pneumonia, neonatal sepsis, intra abdominal infection that happens to be a very interesting space with high unmet need, et cetera, et cetera. So, from India to do drug discovery is extremely challenging, but we are trying to change that into our advantage. What does that mean? Very early on in our life, we got pathogens out of St. John's Hospital and Narayana Hridayala Hospital that were multi-drug resistant and some even pan-drug resistance even to cholesterol with, because of MCR1. And that became the test bed for our assets from early on, not some ATCC strain or strain I can get from JMI or IHMA, which are five-star strains. So we got the worst strains. And today I'd like to share with this audience that Bugworks assets have been tested on 15,000 MDR isolates across the world, pretty much because I, I don't like to drink my own Kool-Aid. We don't like to drink our own Kool-Aid. We said we're going to go around the world so got the worst isolates and we have a great opportunity to do something wonderful for our people and for the world. Huge challenges ahead, Dr. Gafur. We have to complete successfully phase one, novel uh, chemical asset, safety issues, pharmacokinetic issues. We seem to be okay thus far, but we can't call ourselves a success until we complete phase one. If phase one is successful in 2023 from Australia, we are very, very confident that the translation for phase two, phase three will be very good. Because unlike oncology and other areas, the translation between preclinical and clinical, the PKPD sciences are very well defined. So cautiously, highly cautiously optimistic that from India, we can crack a broad spectrum problem handle, uh, and handle uh, multimicrobial infections like what you guys are seeing nowadays. So some ways to go, but treading along with cautious optimism. Thank you, Anand. We are really proud that an Indian scientist, Indian company, is an Indian startup is working on such a promising molecule. And we are really praying that we'll go to phase two, phase three, and in a few years' time, we'll get that in our hand to treat our patients. Thank you, Doctor. We, so we are we really need this molecule. And I, I do know that you had a challenging time in developing in molecule. I'll come back to that. We would like to listen to the challenges. I'll come back to that later. Radha, Dr. Radha, I do know you when you are in the private sector, when you are running your own company. And recently you moved to government. But until now, what was the excellent work you are doing with your company and your experience and the challenges you faced? Thank you, uh, Dr. Gafur, for, uh, for the opportunity to participate on this panel today. Um, it's great to be with, uh, with this uh, stellar cast. 
Um, Anand, uh, you know, congratulations to you for this very, very difficult journey, but taking it forward against such very, very hard, um, you know, uh, tides and, um, and, 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 and various challenges related to antibacterial drug discovery. And, and, and to Dr. Balganesh for, you know, looking at a completely, for, for focusing on a completely different approach, because ultimately, I think when we are looking at the problem of AMR, uh, it's going to, I believe really that we need a multiplicity of approaches and, um, you know, what Dr. Gupta was referring to and what you were referring to as well, which is, you know, patients who have, who have come into the hospital for some other purpose, you know, for treatment, uh, which is completely unrelated to infections, you know, needing antibiotics. And in fact, you know, that very highly vulnerable ta uh, target population is the one that is suffering the most. And almost all of us have some personal experience or the other of seeing a, uh, seeing a family member, you know, being, being, uh, uh, being um, you know, falling prey to a highly resistant infection uh, and not making it. So it's, it, I think it's, it's very much, uh, it's, it's, it, it, it is very much in the foreground for most people. Uh, but this is not a new problem. The AMR has been growing as a as a as a uh, as a medical and clinical unmet need uh, for 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 decades. In fact, when you look at the history of antibiotic development, um, you know, starting with the 1940s when penicillin was discovered, you know, for about 20 years there was a fantastic run for antibiotics because, and this is the Waxman plot platform of looking for antibiotics from from soil microbes, and it was a very prolific phase. But after about twenty years or so of that, uh, you know, the same sets of microbes started to be cultured, and no longer could that approach uh, hold weight anymore. And then the shift towards more uh, towards synthetic chemistry, which led us to analytic acid, which was you know the, the precursor to the, the, the fluoroquinolones. But then from there until 2000, there was this big drought, absolutely no new antibiotics. Wild resistance was, was growing and developing. And in, in the early 2000s, we had a new drug for gram-positive infections, which was uh, linezolid. Uh, and around that time, uh, there were also major, uh, there were major exits from the antibacterial space of big pharma. Uh, because they felt that um, a lot of the money, the investment that had gone into antibacterial drug discovery had yielded very little. So what you, what you might, what your uh, audience uh, may not know is that between 1960s or, you know, a little bit later than that to, uh, to, to the 2000s, the shift in the pharmaceutical industry uh, were moved from, you know, sort of this natural product-based drug discovery to highly synthetic approaches uh, high throughput screening of large libraries uh, looking for early hits, which could then be optimized. And that approach was a grand failure, was a terrible failure. It caused the industry tremendous losses. That together with the overall um, commercial opportunity that this, um, that, that developing antibiotics um, entails, you know, the, the lack thereof, should I say. Uh, led to a massive exodus of the pharmaceutical industry in, in, you know, in the 2000s. And once they exited, then uh, the, uh, you know, the, the responsibility of developing or addressing AMR, I think, was then left to a clutch of small companies and startups and biotechs that still believed um, that there could be new antibiotics, new antibacterial compounds that that come to market and that can continue to address the problem of resistance because as we know that problem is never going to go away and as more and more complex uh, techniques uh, medications etc cetera, etc cetera, come uh, you know become available to patients for treating uh, various indications uh, the need for anti antibiotics will simply never go away so it was in this context and then so you know, my own story was that um, after training in the U.S. for many years, uh, doing a Ph.D. in postdoctoral work in infectious diseases at the Harvard School of Public Health, I came back to India to work in industry at the drug discovery division of Dr. Reddy's laboratories, where at that time there was a lot of optimism about new drugs being developed from India and, and the possibility of doing that 
uh, uh, really was the, the the promise was 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 palpable. We all felt it, and you know there was a group of people who returned to India around that time. My own cohort at BRN was substantial. Uh, although we didn't work singularly on antimicrobial infections, there was uh, at least capacity building and uh, and huge uh, effort that went into developing new drugs. However, industry in India, pharmaceutical the pharmaceutical industry in India also decided to. Uh, to not just get away from AMR and infectious diseases, but from drug discovery as a whole. So by the end of you know, 2009, 2010, and early 2010, 11, 12, you saw in the Indian pharmaceutical industry, a massive shutdown of drug discovery uh, efforts uh, across the country. The BRL, Ranpaxis, uh, you know, um, the Ramals, and so on. So, there was this growing feeling that you can't do drug discovery work in India, period, whether it was for AMR or anything else. So it was in this context that in 2011, after leaving DRL, uh, you know, there was, a, there was a team of us that believed that we could actually develop novel antibacterials to treat infections. And our premise was that you can do drug discovery and development from India more cost effectively and take drugs to market at much lower cost than what is popularly you know, believed, uh, you know, one to two billion, depending on whose estimates you look at. And our thinking was that by working in a very focused manner, uh, keeping uh, antibacterial, novel antibacterial, that is novel scaffolds to overcome infection, overcome uh, high, uh, highly resistant infections, that, you know, and, and, and together with uh, really uh, building public-private partnerships that we would be able to take uh, new drugs into clinic and our our model was to take compounds, uh, at least, you know, to proof of concept and then to look for out licensing partners. However, you know, this, the global, the, 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 the global landscape for out licensing uh, has been bleak, continues to be bleak, and it was very bleak even, uh, you know, uh, around 20, 2018, 19, uh, when we had highly uh, potent optimized compounds, but it was, it was very challenging to actually see uh, you know, uh, to to actually uh, figure out a path for these compounds to 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 go to market, uh, to to even go through clinical development, which is when the company that I founded, Vitas Pharma, we sold all of the assets, uh, and uh, and and you know, uh, then the compounds uh, are now being developed outside the country. But you know, we we decided to to. Uh, we decided that if something has to come out of our R and D, then um, this was the this was the path. So that decision had to be made. It was a it was a difficult decision, and it was not one that sat well with my original premise that we can do this from India. I'm happy to see people like Anand still able to persevere and take that weight on forward. But during this period, I developed this belief. I de developed the belief that if we want to do such very cutting edge R&D from India, we will have to strengthen public private partnerships, which is why my current role as director of the Central Drug Research Institute is, a, is an opportunity for me to, to really test that hypothesis, to work with private partners and to really find ways to do things together, especially to address very tough problems like AMR. And so, you know, I'm gonna stop there, but I think uh, you get a sense of, you know, what, where I think, uh, solutions could lie. Thank you, Radha. You gave a very good summary of why we are not having new antibodies from a global perspective. And you re really explained the challenges you face as a, as a scientist trying to develop the molecule from a private setup in India. And you believe that from sitting in a government role, we can develop more public-private partnership and that could be the way forward. It's a, it's a very good background that we can we can discuss further. And thanks for giving that detail and, and very important information. Uh, Taslim Arif, you are the CEO of CCAMP, an organization who, who has brought together multiple teams of scientists and helps many scientific teams to develop molecules and diagnostics. Would you please talk a bit about how you developed the CCAMP? Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, first of all, I think let me join my previous speakers who has already spoken very, uh, you know, fairly well about the, you know, the larger threat of uh, AMR that we all face. 
but also join to say that this excellent effort, Dr. Gafoor and your team to you know bring together and build an awareness uh, for the awareness AMR awareness week that is in front of us. Uh, it's the sheer uh, severity of the the issue that we need to keep talking so that the different stakeholders, all from all quarters of the society, come together and address this very important issue. And I think I'm kudos to you to build this up. So congratulations. I think previous speakers have already <clears throat> mentioned the issue, uh, you know, uh, the larger issue from the hospital setting to the effort of the new drug development using bacteriophages, the issue, you know, from the perspective of cautious uh, optimism that uh, Anand had indicated. And I think rather very, very well put forward the larger issue, how the journey has happened in different uh, parts of India. If I may just add up and uh, the part that possibly will just rather repeating some of the points would be that how <clears throat> uh, AMR is a contextual issue as well. So while it is a global issue, it is also a very important that is a contextual issue in terms of the geography that is sitting in. It impacts globally back or, or the other way around. But I think we have to, if we were to look at from a perspective of building solutions, building uh, capabilities, even policies, it is actually a very contextual and we have to look at those. And towards that, uh, CCAM over years, as you mentioned, has been attempting to build uh, deep science innovation, but largely, very largely based on the good need understatement, you know, in terms of understanding of the need on the ground. And AMR or infectious disease is a very clear uh, aspect in because uh, the issues of infectious diseases, be it therapeutic, be it prevention, be it diagnostics, um, uh, are very contextual in local settings, how it works in the, uh, you know, tier one cities, tier two cities, tier three cities, urban settings to, you know, uh, rural settings. And what we have attempted to do is to pick ideas which understand those problems in those settings and try to solve it. While we have do know about the global uh, players who build products, I think I am completely sold and convinced on the idea that India going forward will have to build indigenous innovations for the local problems. Because those settings are very important because not always, uh, you know, the innovations that come uh, directly as an imported ones are the final answers to our problems. And we'll have to have a combination of it. I'm not at all saying that they are not going to be the final answers, but it's going to be combination of it. From that perspective, we have been attempting to build deep science innovations, largely in healthcare areas. And as we grew forward, and I would just give a credit to Bergworks, who actually around the time that we actually began working in the entrepreneurship 12, 13, 14, began understanding the, the larger issue of AMR. And you know, we actually, along our journey of AMR is mostly you know, together with Bergworks. And we kept adding further things on it. Uh, in terms of our understanding. And we have now over the last eight to 10 years, now we have easily around 50 to 60 innovations working in AMR that is dedicated under our umbrella, not even advising them. And that is very important. <clears throat> number is not to put the, you know, possibly numbers on top, but we will need these numbers or even more going forward to solve the problems on the ground. And for us, AMR is a problem that actually starts from prevention, first of all. If we talk about the products or solution, I'm not even bringing the uh, policies and so on for now or awareness, but prevention of AMR, how do you prevent uh, the spread of infection is a very important thing, be it in ICU setting or be it in a non-ICU setting, hospital setting, OPD settings, outside. What are the ways to do that? And we are very, very blessed and give an example of it to have now a US FD approved product with us from India, from Bangalore, called Poyo Labs in Exum, which have and now the product is uh, you know towards prevention of ventilator associated pneumonia, a classic case that all hospitals actually happen when a patient is ventilated. So it's a phenomenal, uh, you know, I would say <clears throat> push. They got the best uh, innovation award across all Commonwealth uh, you know countries uh, and so on. So this is prevention as we talk about. The second one, of course the players like uh, the Bugworks and Gangajan and many others who are actually taking it as a build together. Bugworks and Gangajan have been more or less flagships inspiring others to actually build it forward. It's very important you have rock stars who inspire others, who give them the belief. And I believe this, are, this, you know, this 
entities are the our rock stars who inspire others to take such a plunge in different areas that we know very well. And then there is comes in diagnostics. According to me, and we all have seen, diagnostics will be absolutely important for us to build diagnostics, which is affordable, accessible, point of care, to ensure that we can give, uh, you know, to have an early detection and appropriate medication of the antibiotic. We all know the case of it, but very, you know, just to give you a perspective, we actually right now are sitting uh, in a place where we do not have a really rapid AST approved diagnostics in India. We do not have a rapid one, right? While the other countries have a very high end, but those are not affordable in the setting we are talking about. So we'll have, we are towards it. And my, my optimistic guess on that, or, you know, would be that in a year or two, uh, around those timelines, we should have approved rapid point of care AST tests from India, built from India, serving people at the same rate that the usual classical diffusion assays or others are being built. And that would be phenomenal where we can do five, six, seven hours of AST within that time. If I may just close out and not to take too much of time on that, you know, understanding all this, that there are so many different stakeholders and all that with support from all of you, CCAMP under the guidance of the principal scientific advisor uh, has set up something what we call this IAIH, India AMR Innovation Hub, which is nothing but a converging platform. It's a converging platform of all stakeholders, national, international, academia, industry, foundations, uh, government setup, and so on. And we have began the activities on those where quick one-line idea is to collectively sit on one table, identify the current ongoing problems, uh, propose uh, immediate possible solutions for those and implement those solutions. And fourth point is to then build models around those to disseminate and you know put it across. This is a very important thing. Identification, solution, implementation, and outcome of those as models for larger. And that's why the role of PSA would be very important because outcomes of those uh, pilots will allow ministries to actually implement those if those have been successful. So those are the efforts, uh, Dr. Gafur, I just wanted to mention. I'll come back to the details of it uh, so that I don't take too much of time. But I think AMR, if I may close, I think is a collective effort of all. And startups and innovators would play a crucial role going forward in terms of giving us the solutions that the healthcare, uh, you know, even a implementation of the system can actually make interventions and build it forward. Thank you. Thank you, Taslim Arif. To my doctor friends in the audience, did you hear what Dr. Taslim Arif said? CCAM has 50 to 60 innovations related to AMR. I was not aware of that. I knew you were doing excellent work, but 50 to 60 innovations, and I consider myself a so-called AMR expert. This is the, you know, the, the lack of understanding of our our clinical doctors and to, to what exactly our wonderful scientists are doing in their laboratories. And we need to change that. Probably a discussions like this between scientists and doctors will change that. We will understand scientists more and scientists will understand clinicians more. We have Dr. Balganesh back. Dr. Balganesh? Sorry. I... <laughs> Today is just a, what do you call it? One of those days. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so, Ganga Jen, you know, what's your, what's the level of development of bacteriophages and other molecules you're working related to AMR to the, in the, that we, we can look forward from a clinical perspective? Okay. So, uh, in the last four or five years, we have taken one molecule all the way into phase uh, one phase two A. Uh, this was molecule, which is an interesting. So, you also have to ask the que biggest question: is uh, how do you position a molecule? Right. I mean, I know from a clinician's perspective, what you want is a is a molecule which works on air. bug. which works on all the different, uh, but from a, from a perspective of our development of one of these molecules, the biggest question that comes in 
is uh, how do you position a monarchy? So coming into an area which was absolutely new, which is bacteriophages uh, for treatment, uh, we had this big debate you want to go for an indication like maybe pneumonia or you want to go if you come one step lower was an indication like uh, burn infections where staph and pseudomonas are the major issues or is there even more in, uh, an unmet medical need but the bar is not set very high right so we looked at uh, this was in early 2000, but by the time we did this, this was 2010. Uh, insulin resistant staph aureus carriers. Uh, you are a clinician, you know 80% of infections in uh, chronic kidney patients, uh, uh, as well as uh, many ICU patients, is carrying MRSA in the nasal uh, uh, anterior. And tedious okay so we said okay uh, we went to the regulator uh, and uh, we did a discussion a couple of discussions with the fda in the us and then fda in singapore and we then went into patients i'm sorry i'm giving you a long answer apologies on that but we went into patients uh, and uh, we're looking for clearance of uh, medicine staff from the nasal uh, nares. And uh, we did a trial of actually uh, a protein derived from a bacteriophage. We could clearly show it was dose dependent, but we had a market failure then. Because by the time, uh, yeah, Anand says turn off your uh, video. Okay, maybe that's better. Um, by in terms of market, it was a market failure because by the time we were able to show this, methicillin no longer was a, a huge issue. You already had a few more drugs which had come in, daptomycin had come in, and uh, then we had to take the decision what are we going to do with that? So we then placed that for uh, staph bacteremia, uh, especially by uh, septicemia, bacteremia with the right sided endocarditis. So currently the molecule is positioned for that and we're talking to, uh, we're just on the verge of an IND discussion with uh, FDA on taking this molecule forward. So the uh, way we took one molecule all the way for a particular indication, we couldn't take it through further because of market condition, market, what shall I say, um, requirement or market forces. And the second one, we are now looking at um, septicemia with right uh, sided endocarditis. Dr. Gafur, that's uh, my answer to your question. Thank you, Dr. Balganesh. Dr. Balganesh used the term market forces, which clinicians like me, Neha, and others usually don't hear much. But we need to understand that particular term because drug developers, they talk about market forces. If they develop a drug, unless there is support for the market in various ways, they will not be able to market their drug. And unless they're able to market their drug, they will not be able to succeed and develop further molecules. So that's very important aspect that we clinicians should be understanding. We should know the other side of the story. Anand, would you please talk to us the challenges you faced in your drug development work? Right. Thank you, uh, Dr. Gafur. Many challenges, but I want to first start with some of the things that are going on in our ecosystem so our clinicians uh, in this call can understand. One is there has been excellent government support, Dr. Gafur, for early stage innovation, CCAMP, IKP, etc. So the clinicians should understand that this is a new India. We have probably 15, 20 incubators, great government labs like where Radha is sitting in right now that are seeding, giving us infrastructure. I have no plant and missionary. I sit in CCAMP. So that's great, right? Government did it. The issues, the big issue we face is, again, for this audience, it takes anywhere between half a billion to one billion dollars to get a novel antibiotic done. A billion dollars is about 8,200 crores. 15 years, 12 to 15 years, let's keep it 15 years by the time your drug is out, right? And then anti-infectives are the only category where you don't want people to use your drug too much and create high volume. It makes absolutely no 
business sense, right? You work, your success rate is five to 7%, 12 to 15 years, half a billion to 1 billion, depending on whether you're going to US FDA or EMA or looking at low to medium income countries. Let's, let's normalize it for today's discussion to half a million. That's 4,000 crores, right? So this kind of massive investment is possible only if we begin to treat antibiotics and anti-infectives as an infrastructure and not as another drug where you sell and make money in volume. We never care about how many times a battleship is fired or we never care about how many times an expensive F-16 is used by our Air Force. It's there to protect our country when a bad day comes. Anti-infectives have to be treated that way. I realize there's no other business model. This is my fifth startup. I may or may not succeed in this startup, but I know that anti-infectives in AMR, a business model does not exist until governments across the world, including ours, wake up and treat it as a medical infrastructure and not as pharma company trying to make money fleecing people. That narrative doesn't exist in anti-infectives. So with such so many odds against us, we need some support. The support comes in three ways. I'm going to start with clinicians, actually, because in our country, except for a few names like Dr. Kafoor and others that we hear about, we don't see the clinicians coming together like IDSA does in the US with Infectious Diseases Society of America, sitting in Delhi with Ministry of Health, with Niti Ayo, with the Prime Minister's office to say, AMR is probably a bigger problem than COVID. At least in COVID, we had vaccines. Here we have no pipeline, Mr. Minister or Mrs. Minister. So where is that core mass of clinicians that are creating awareness in the government? Because if Balaganesh or I go to government, they immediately look at you with suspicion. Are you trying to make public money out of us? And we don't want it. We don't even want to make money out of India. We only want to save our people in India. We will use Western markets to make some money to survive. We are already very hypoxic. All we are looking for is basic oxygen to live. India won't give it. No problem. We don't want the money from the Indian government. But we want this group of clinicians to sit with the Indian government to raise awareness so that from the prime minister's level down, there is a clarion call on AMR, prevention, diagnostics, devices, therapeutics, vaccines, all five are required. They're all part of the same equation. So Dr. Gafu, we need the government to wake up. Honestly, they've done good things in seeding people like us, but where is the regulator? I'd love to see the regulator putting their hand up and saying, we are in sync with FDA. Here is the accelerated pathway. Our country needs top three biggest challenges in India today are lack of antibiotics, hospital acquired infection, neonatal sepsis. We all know it. The regulator has to put up the hand and say, this is the top three clarion call. Here is an accelerated pathway. We will never compromise safety of patients, but accelerated pathway. Number two, since there is no volume concept in AMR, and we are not going to milk people like diabetes or cardiovascular or statins or anything like that, all we need is some basic support for sustenance. These are called pull incentives, Dr. Gafur. And countries that don't have an AMR problem like ours, like the United States, UK, Sweden, Norway, are implementing pull incentives that says, if you crack gram negative, if you come up with a broad spectrum that can replace meropen and pigisacline cholestin, we are giving you some amount of money so that you can keep the lights on. That's called a pull incentive. So our country, with all the wonderful work we are doing, we need both push incentives that are grants that are able to fund our clinical trials and offer us accelerated pathways, push. And then you need the pull. There are no market forces to make pull happen. Governments have to invest in a military-like infrastructure to make it happen. So my humble submission is doctors have to create that awareness. If, because if this problem is real, like Dr. Gupta and Dr. Kafur and many others are saying, why isn't Ministry of Health aware of it coming from the clinicians, not just from the scientists? Number two, regulatory pathways have to be working in tandem with USFT and EMA and make it more acceleratable. Number three, some basic market support is required from Niti Aayog, Ministry of Health, etc., so that innovators can survive. And I want to finish up with a little sobering note. Success rate is 5%. So, Doc, we need at least 20 drugs going to the pipe to potentially get one or two that are passed. I mean, I'm in no illusion that our drug will, will, will go through clinical trials easily. Brand new mechanism, new chemo type, dual target, God knows. But we need 10, 15, 20 in a pipeline. So one of the clarion calls of India has to be creation of a diagnostics and drug discovery pipeline and support us with basic oxygen to keep that lights on. Thank you. Dr. Anand, by 
listening to your discussion. I great respect for you and sympathy too. I believe you haven't mortgaged your house to develop an antiviral. Only thing left. <laughs> you know, that's, that's probably, I, I advise you as a friend, never do that. You know, I, I, I respect your commitment, but don't go to that extent. But that, you know, I, we, I, I actually, you know, I've been working with the AMR for the last 15 years in the country. I walked into every offices in the health ministry and other ministries to discuss on AMR. And I know we convinced the government, they always act. We brought out the H1 rule to regulate OTC, whether implemented or the ground, uh, on the ground or not. And I do know I was personally involved in bringing out the Colistin Growth Promotional Bank, along with several other stakeholders. We convinced them then they, they work. But probably it's a mistake of people like experts, including myself, that we never try to communicate with the government this particular aspect that we need. We have Indian teams. We are brilliant Indian scientists. We need to support them to develop drugs, molecules, and diagnostics. We really never did that. So I think it's a fault of everybody, including the so-called experts like myself. We need to change. We need to talk to authorities. We need people who can develop drugs. They're taking huge risk. And we need to support them in every possible way. Myself and my friends, clinicians, we should raise our voice on this particular aspect now. It's our responsibility. It's our responsibility to our patients and our country. And we must do that. Dr. Radha, now, until now, you have been with the private sector, now move to the government setup. So you know the challenges of people like Anand. How can our government help? We have a wonderful government. And I know why we reached this stage. I explained that. Our government will listen to people if we try to if we convince them. How can we convince the government that? We need to support our startups to develop molecules and diagnostics. Thank you, Dr. Kafur. It's a hard question to answer, but I'm going to offer you some, some perspectives. Um, I think Anand spoke eloquently about, you know, uh, what is needed, uh, what are some basic expectations for a drug developer based in India developing drugs for a very, very uh, difficult problem with very little commercial opportunity and and also uh, you know Tasleem talking about the amazing foundations of innovation that have been laid through through the work at CCAM. I mean it's it's incredible what has happened in the last 10 years in our country uh, when we started uh, Vitas Pharma in 2011 Virac didn't exist and many of the programs that came 2012 onwards, you know, we were some of the first recipients to apply for them, try them out, give, you know, be part of that. I feel like we've, like Anand talks about, you know, growing with C Camp. you know, I sort of have that feeling about also my association with Virac. So, and Anand is right that, you know, for early stage innovation, there's a lot of grant funding available. These are small pots of money. They take you a certain distance, but then the question is, how do you get through? Uh, you know, the, the more expensive phases. Now, at CDRI, for example, uh, we have programs in malaria, tuberculosis, and also in, you know, uh, bacterial infections, drug-resistant bacterial infections caused by escape pathogens and so on and so forth. The premise here is that there is no business model for developing any drugs for infectious diseases. It's not just for AMR. It's the same is true for malaria and TB. There is no business model. So, we have to do this as a in the interest of the larger public good you know so it means that we that the that the public sector has to play a larger than life role in actually supporting development all the way through all the way and i stress all the way because right now we have we have schemes and various funding mechanisms for for, for going from point a to point b but as I've said in other forums as well, we need to have mechanisms to go all the way to market. And it's only then that we can actually tell a true story. And we have to include as many partners as possible in this journey. Now, let's take some good examples from government. Take the rotavirus vaccine. What happened with that vaccine? It was developed with DBT support together in a public-private partnership all the way to market take the COVID vaccine, Covaxin, take a whole slew of other 
COVID related innovations that were supported by government and because of the urgency, because of the, 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 the sheer unmet need, uh, these were supported much more, um, you know, end to end than, uh, than you see uh, in other categories of innovation. So we have examples from government where, uh, where innovation has been supported all the way. So why is this not a repeatable phenomenon? Or why is this not, why do we not see this in AMR? So there may be many reasons for this, but I think what we need to do is we need to speak with one voice. We need to have some sort of a mission mode approach to AMR and say, as a country, like Tasleem talked about this hub, I'm really happy to hear about this because perhaps these kinds of platforms or forums can become places from which we articulate very, very specific, critical, prioritized needs for which a solution is required. And by taking on such a mission mode, like the rotavirus vaccine is a typical example of a mission mode uh, innovation. In fact, if you look at science and develop science and technology in India, if you look at what has really done very well in India, it is the Department of Spaces, the programs. We have launched vehicles, satellites after satellites and done extremely well. And we are global leaders now. And why is that? Because it's a very focused mission mode approach to solving a problem. So my belief is that we can set these priorities. We have to do them together, public and private. Uh, and we have to overcome this huge trust deficit so that partners can work better together across the public and private space and take things forward in a, in a sort of a, um, in, a, in a more collaborative mode um and support and and then what happens is that let's say that government is able to support the development process then there are companies uh that are already in the ecosystem that can manufacture and distribute right so because that part of the pharmaceutical industry is very well developed in India. so in fact we would have bridged the entire gap so uh in in some what i would say is that yes we have to really leverage uh support from the public sector uh, create very, very highly prioritized programs in which public private stakeholders participate and take things for, to conclusion. And eventually, I think this is the only way that we will actually, uh, th th that we will build capacity in this country to address problems which are also, you know, which are, which we haven't talked about in this conversation, like chikungunya and dengue and so on and so forth, which afflict our country more than anywhere else. And who is going to develop drugs for that? So ultimately, I think this is this is how we can we can we we will we will build capacity in India and focus on our priorities um, um, and hopefully we can we can really uh, make that happen through concerted efforts of of multiple stakeholders. Thank you, Dr. Radha. You stress India is a leader in the space today, Spain science science today. We can be the leader in drug development as well. We have the ability, we have the resources, and we can do it, and we should do it. Dr. Taslim Arif, please tell us, you know, how, how our country can be the leader in drug, drug and diagnostic development. Yeah, uh, I think significant things have been said. Uh, I think it will be uh, a combination of steps, Dr. Kapoor. It has to be a combination of steps. It is not going to be a one piece of the puzzle fixing everything. It has to be uh, many things coming together. And I think uh, all my previous speakers actually brought out a few points which are very crucial because just like a puzzle, you know, you, you have 80% fixed, but 20% not there. It is not, the outcome is still not solved. I think we'll have to act very, very, uh, you know, collectively together, uh, have everyone being on the same page with the same amount of passion to solve it. Uh, if not, uh, many efforts may actually may not reach the finish line of the impact that we all want to do together. And I think hence, that is the primary reason that we need to continuously get the stakeholders on the side, convert them, if I may say so, in terms of building it together the participation from the market participation from the government participation from the society participation from the clinical stakeholders participate from a diagnostic uh, uh, industry innovators society at large as well 
I think it's a very important thing. I'll not go further on it, but this is a very important thing. If I may want to say how we want to, you know, from the side of what we've done, I think as <laughs> rather Terry mentioned, I think these are in a way significant things have moved in last 10 years. Uh, I think we do know that in terms of the building innovations, many things have moved in last 10 years. Emergence of DBT Bayrak was a clearly a huge masterstroke in terms of building healthcare innovations, life science innovations at large, including other domains. And I think that has spurred already a <clears throat> good amount of momentum uh, in the innovations that are being taken forward. And then other agencies, including the DSTs of the world, the, including the CSIR, the MITE, the AIM, and so on, have, are taking it forward. Now, what we need, if I now I just take a pause and say, so good momentum has been built. Excellent early work has been done. But many a times we shouldn't possibly uh, look at only the first few steps. There is always have to be next steps and then there always have to be next steps after that. I think what is very needed now is actually the scale, uh, scale up option, the integration of the government, the dialogues of the industry, innovators, hospitals, government, all happening together at the right amount and with a clear, I may say so, a clear decision-making approach. I think dialogues should be from decision making and action points perspective, which would allow us to actually take it forward. We may fail, we may have mistakes, but we would not want to really go further. So I think it's a collection. So if I may summarize, I know I think we may have to close, but very quick summary on that. It's a converging is an important thing, very important. Scale up is the second thing. And third is that uh, the decision making approach, you know, taking even, uh, you know, bold decisions for a systemic level is an important thing as we go forward. I'll stop here for now. Thank you. Thank you, Taslim Arif. Dr. Neha Gupta. Hi, Dr. Kafur. Now you listen to the stories of our wonderful stories of our brilliant scientists. As a clinician, are we hopeful that our country will be able to provide a solution to the global challenge of AMR? As you just mentioned, and you were positive as well, I think listening to all the experts, there is definitely hope that we will be able to have solution for the problem of AMR in the near future. And Dr. Tasli Marif actually mentioned it very clearly, the diagnostics are very, very important. They have to be available, reliable, quick and cost effective. If we make the right diagnosis, we can actually give very specific therapy. And that is very, very important. And it starts right from an, uh, right for a clinician who's sitting in the OPD, not in the tertiary care center and seeing patients with fever, where there can be so many complicated, there can be several uh, differential diagnoses. And if we make the right diagnosis, we can cut down on the antibiotics there. And thereafter, it can trickle down to the tertiary care centers as well. So everything is very important. And of course, um, definitely very hopeful and positive for, uh, for a brighter future. Thank you, Dr. Neha. You know, to our wonderful panelists, you know, the world discusses India as a country with high antimicrobial resistance rate. In five years' time, if you all work together, wonderful scientists like yours, will change that perspective. The world will see India as a country who provided solution to the global challenge of AMR. And with your help, I think our, I'm sure our country will be able to achieve that. We will save the world from the global challenge of AMR. Thank you for the wonderful panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you a lot. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Dr. Kapoor. Thank you. Thanks great, to all. Great, thanks. A very good final discussion. Now, we doctors and other stakeholders know that the excellent work our Indian scientists do, and we also know the challenges they face. Now, we'll move on to the next session. That is Dr. Brad Spellberg. He's one of the most prominent infectious disease physicians in US. He's also an expert in health policy. Dr. Brad will now talk on a new sustainable model for antibiotic research and development.
Thank you very much for the invitation to a view that's probably somewhat different than many of the other speakers have discussed. And this is not new for me to express. So I have been offering this message for some years now. We need to fundamentally change the way we view antimicrobial resistance and development of new antibiotics so that it is no longer about achieving the moon, but in this case for resistance, five years later, you've lost the moon, right? Because of the emergence of resistance. We need a sustainable model of long-term antibiotic R&D, which is fundamentally different than how it's been done in the past. The ideas that I'm gonna tell you about today have been published in high impact journals over the last decade. <clears throat> so there are some references you can go to for more detail. I think it's important to start by pointing out that, that in the early 2000s, I was the card carrying incentive guy. I was the guy who wrote, first authored the white papers for societies and gave testimony to Congress supporting the passage of gain and wrote papers for the National Academy of Medicine on how to turn around the pipeline, which was all about financial incentives because that's what was needed at the time. But that was 15 to 20 years ago, and I'm no longer the card-carrying incentive guy. We need to keep going with push incentives, that is deferring the upfront R&D expenses. But the idea of giving more economic incentives than we have in place now, I am not in support of. I'm actually overtly opposed to. Why would that be? Why would I evolve? Why would I change my mind? Because the world evolves and we need to evolve our solutions as the world evolves around us. But if you're in the bubble, that ID industrial complex bubble, it's a combination of industry and academia and certain specialty societies, nothing ever gets better. Things are always worse. Every year is worse than the year before. I mean, at this rate, we should all be dead from antimicrobial resistance because for 25 years, every year has been worse than the prior year in the bubble. And that means you need more money. You always need more money. There is no amount of money that is enough. There is no amount of money that will say, okay, that's enough, we, we're good now. No, things are always worse and we'll always need more money. There's a real set of fundamental problems with living in this bubble. If you've been saying the same thing, preaching the same solutions for 20 years, but every year at the same time, you've been saying things are getting worse, maybe the solutions you're proposing aren't actually effective first. Second, it turns out actually things are better. That's the thing. Things bottomed out around 2008, 9, and 10. And since then, things have been getting somewhat better. The solutions we fought for actually have helped. And if you don't admit that, why would anybody else ever get on board with solutions you propose? And third, as I alluded to, our needs for solutions evolve as the world evolves around us. Sticking blinkered with the same message year after year is not effective policy. So what has changed? Well, first, we actually got substantial push incentives. In 2002, three and four, when we began this push, there were no such things. We spent a decade pushing to get economic push incentives in place. They're in place and they're working. So that's a win. We should celebrate and acknowledge that positive gain from the advocacy we have done. Second, as a result, actually new antibiotic approvals have markedly improved. I'll show you the numbers. We're at the fastest clip of new antibiotic approvals since the mid 90s. That's 30 years ago. Third, it turns out a lot of the drugs that have approved are things we don't need. Industry took the push incentive money and gave us Me Too drugs that make very little difference. Fourth, industry nowadays makes so much money in the pharmaceutical and biotech sector to make new drugs attractive to them. You need to have a billion dollar drug or at least a half billion dollar drug and that's never going to happen again for antibiotics and we'll talk about why so that solution of just praying that we can push enough money into place to have a billion dollar antibiotic seller that's a hopeless that's like the the prayer of the dead that's not going to happen uh, even if you thought it could work 
is the U.S. really in a position to do this for the rest of the world? It's not like the rest of the world is creating these incentives, right? We're $31 trillion in debt now. Are we just the endless taxpayer that's supposed to just shelling out our hard-earned cash for more and more industry subsidies with no end? There is a time where you say, look, we're new billion dollar subsidies year after year after year. And finally, again, we've learned more about our past. It was this article actually that really started to change my thinking when I first was presented, it was first presented to me. Um, I had never seen it before, but here's the quote from the article. The needs are multifold to overcome problems of resistance to use against gram negative bacillary infections, more active and less toxic ones for fungal infections, better ones against mycobacteria and for the prevention and treatment of viral infections. Who wrote this and when? I mean, it seems remarkably modern and up to date. These are exactly the issues we need to address today, are they not? But this was written in 1965. This is the problem. We have no institutional memory of what came before us. All we do is put our head down and say, worse, 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 more, more, more money, money without remembering that actually this is the third time we've been through this cycle. We keep cycling. We have boom and bust cycles in the antimicrobial space. So there's the famous saying, those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it, or as my dear colleague has said, new ideas are often based on the recognition of old truths. There's this fascinating quote in this round table study or paper from 1965. There is the possibility that we're gonna run out of new antibiotics to discover, and if that is the case, what we should really want is to introduce them one by one at fairly long intervals. The idea of throwing $30 billion of incentives in place to get 30 new drugs on the market in the span of five years is a terrible moonshot idea. That works if your goal is to go to the moon. Once you've gone to the moon, you've been there. If you wanna keep ahead of resistance, it's a terrible idea because five years after you get those 30 drugs onto market, those 30 drugs are gonna be suffering from resistance. We need a long-term, slow, sustainable solution, a slow, steady drip, drip, drip of new solutions over decades to centuries, not a one-time moonshot. So interestingly, in the same paper in 1965, they lamented the bust of the antibiotic pipeline. This is nearly 60 years ago, people. You think this is a new discussion? It's not. Here's their graph from their paper showing the boom, the first boom from the 40s through the 50s. And then by the late 50s and into the 60s, there was a collapse of the pipeline. Why? Because there was no more unmet need. They filled the pipeline with antibiotics to treat everything. And until resistance caught up to those drugs, there wasn't going to be more money to be made by bringing new antibiotics to market. So by the by the uh, early 90s, um, things had changed, right? So in the 70s to the er through the 80s, there was a second boom because resistance began to emerge to the drugs that had been developed in the 40s and 50s. The pipeline collapsed and then it came back. Resistance caught up, new unmet need. But by the early 90s, that bus, uh, sorry, that second boom was over. And that's when the second bust began. And that's when I emerged onto the scene in 2004 with this paper in 2004, Trends in Antimicrobial Development. This was the first paper that documented the, the second bust of the antibiotic pipeline. When we published this paper, I wasn't even aware that there had been a first bust and nobody else was either. Nobody remembered that order from 1965. At that time in 2004, there had been a two thirds reduction in new antibiotic approvals. And there were only six antibiotics in development in the pipelines of the largest pharmaceutical and biotech companies in the world, six. During that same period, MRSA exploded out of hospitals and into communities. CRE, <laughs> CRE first appeared and spread. Carbapenem resistant acinetobacter wildly began to spread and so did Pseudomonas. And of course, XDRTB, all of these resistant things hit at the same time as that second pipeline bust occurred. There was truly unmet need. So extensive advocacy efforts were launched. 
it didn't really work for the first few years. You can see we published the first paper going through 2002 in terms of data, and the second paper was published going through 2007. This was the call to action paper was published in 2008. The pipeline had gone further down, 80% decline in new antimicrobial approvals. But that was the nadir. And the reason that was the nadir is because we began to see push incentives taking hold from a variety of both government and private sector sources. MRSA soon became a non-antibiotic issue because multiple MRSA drugs hit the market. So it's a public health problem, but we have lots of drugs that kill MRSA now. We even started to get new gram negative drugs in late stages development between 2008 and 2012. And then gain was passed in 2012, creating um, the first pull incentives. The result of all this advocacy and incentives, and this is what really frustrates me is people don't want to admit it in the bubble. The pipeline is better. It's off the nadir. Now we've had a plateau during the current five-year period because of COVID, right? We've had essentially no antimicrobial development for three years because everything has been invested into the virus. Had that not occurred, we would likely have achieved 10 new drugs during this five-year period and looked very much like we looked in the mid-90s. New antimicrobial approvals are at their fastest clip in the last 30 years. They've tripled over the last 15 years. And according to the Pew Charitable Trust, instead of six new antimicrobials, which were in development in 2004, there are now 42 new antimicrobials in development. And yet people still lament the collapse of the pipeline. I'm sorry, it turns out 42 is a bigger number than six. It's sevenfold bigger as it turns out when you're not living in the bubble. MRSA and VRA are non-issues for new antibiotics. We don't need any antibiotics for those bugs at all. And frankly, even CRE has six approved agents. Now, that doesn't mean they're all available in LMIC countries. That's a different problem. The lack of availability of drugs in LMIC countries that are available in wealthy countries is not a pipeline bust problem. Okay, we'll come back to that point. We even have new drugs for acinetobacter and pseudomonas. Things are better, but the ID industrial complex in the bubble doesn't want to admit that. We actually haven't been looking this good for about 25 years. So what is the problem? Well, there are still long-term sustainability problems. First, as I alluded to, we keep getting industry developing incentivized drugs that we don't really need. If it's in red on this slide, I don't need it at all. If it's in yellow, I might have needed it if it had gotten developed quicker, but by the time it hit the market, it had already become mostly a Me Too drug. It's the green drugs that are drugs that really kind of did truly hit an unmet need. And note that two of them, the TB drugs, were not developed for profit to make money in wealthy countries. So that's two of the four, by the way. Most of the antibiotics we're getting now from industry don't address unmet need. And even those that started addressing unmet need when they were first developed eventually became Me Too's because they were the fourth, fifth, and sixth CRE drugs to hit market. So big surprise. Drugs that don't hit an unmet need that are, that are priced way more expensively than drugs that already exist, they don't sell well. And so the solution is people say, oh, well, they're not selling well. We need more subsidies, more subsidies, more subsidies. There's never enough. On top of extensive push incentives already in place, in the face of massive government budget deficits and historically high debt, for an industry that, in the United States at least, is one of the least popular industries, it ranks right up there with the, with the gun uh, industry, why should taxpayers who are already funding the R&D costs for much of the expenses here up front also provide profit subsidies essentially industry is asking for a free pass we don't want to take any risk because we don't want to fund the r d and we want guaranteed return on investment on the back end as well well then what do we need industry for let's just do it ourselves the question is why is the market failing why are antibiotics not selling as well as they used to sell well part of it not the most of it by the way this is the minority Part of it is that short course therapy is increasingly evidence-based. Durations of therapy are getting shorter, so you make less money because you sell less drug. We also have more effective stewardship finally going into place, which means people are controlling antibiotic usage somewhat more effectively. 
so it's not being as abused as it used to be, so you don't sell as much. And then there's pricing. <clears throat> but all of these things are symptoms because the real issue underlying all of these things, the real issue driving the market failure is simply this. Antibiotics have become commodities, painful for people in the bubble to listen to and accept, but it's true. Why are they commodities? Well, there's more than 90 of them on the market. So when you bring a new one out, it's competing with all 90. And now there's 91 on the market, so the next one has to compete with 91. That problem continually worsens. Each new antibiotic that hits the market exacerbates the competition and exacerbates the commodity marketplace that antibiotics enter. But yet you're charging $10,000 for a commodity product. As I said, every new antibiotic that is approved captures a decreasing share of an ever increasingly crowded market. There is no end to the spiral. And this is what first made me realize, this realization is what first made me realize that the for-profit solution to antibiotics had reached the end, that the future was not going to be sustainable because that spiral is only going to get worse over time. Now you say, yeah, but resistance creates a new market, right? I mean, the drugs on the market, when resistance emerges to them, that knocks off the competition. And that's true, but for a small number of pathogens, right? 15,000 CRE cases in wealthy countries where drug companies make money selling these drugs per year, you're not gonna get a billion dollar drug from 15,000 cases. I'm sorry, it's not gonna happen. It's not enough. The resistance creates a small niche for new drugs relative to the competition already in the marketplace. So here's the wish. Okay, given all that, the solution is obvious. Give us one to two billion dollars of pure profit subsidy per drug we develop. Let's just hand them that cash. You bring a new antibiotic to market, here is your one to two billion dollar prize. We've already subsidized the R&D costs for you and de-risked the molecule, but we're also just gonna give you one to two billion dollars, congratulations. Over and over, for every new antibiotic approved, in perpetuity. And we're supposed to believe that companies are going to take that one to two billion dollars and only develop drugs we need rather than me too drugs that are very similar to drugs that we already have, even though they've not been doing that now. Do you think that sounds realistic? Do you think that the public is going to stand for that, given how unpopular the industry is, given multi trillion dollar deficits and debt? Um, so whether you think it's a good idea or not, and I'm, you obviously know where I think, but even if you think it is a good idea, do you think it's realistic? Because if it's not realistic, let's move on to find something that is realistic. For years, the ID industrial complex has been pushing the same set of legislation to do this kind of thing. Has it ever come close to passing? No. Maybe it's time to focus on a solution that can actually work rather than a wish list that will never actually pass. Maybe instead of arguing with the capital markets, we should actually listen to them. In a capital market, if you can't distinguish your product from other products on the market, you're supposed to not make money. That's how capitalism works. If you charge non-competitive prices, if you charge $10,000 for a commodity, that the competitors are charging $100 for, you're supposed to go out of business. That's what's supposed to happen. Don't talk to me about a Cajun. What happened to a Cajun is a what's supposed to happen in a capital market when you charge excessive amounts of money for a drug that doesn't distinguish itself. You don't ask the taxpayers to bail you out if you're a capitalist. Now, the fire extinguisher analogy comes up all the time, common analogy, and it has some merit for antibiotics. But where it falls apart is that there's no such thing as a $10,000 fire extinguisher. And if there, if some company did develop and put onto the market a $10,000 fire extinguisher, they would go out of business because no one would buy it. Also, um, the government doesn't subsidize the R&D costs of developing the new $10,000 fire extinguisher. This is why I have moved in my mind to the nonprofit solution for new antibiotic development, because nonprofits have the potential to at least mitigate, if not alleviate, 
most of the things that we've talked about. They don't need to make billion dollars per year. They don't need to earn 10% more next year than they did this year, like for-profit biotech and farm. That's the thing. It's not even the amount of money you make this year. If you make a billion dollars this year in pharma and biotech, they expect you to make 1.1 billion next year. It's the need to constantly grow revenue, which will not happen for antibiotics. Nonprofits don't have to do that. Revenues of millions to tens of millions is great for a nonprofit. You don't have to aggressively market, so you're not going to encourage overuse or misuse, and you're going to keep your post-marketing costs low. When these companies tell me, you don't understand, it costs us several hundred million dollars to launch these drugs, I'm like, why are you spending that money on your drug workforce? Are you seriously sending detailing agents to all these doctor's offices to push the new antibiotic? Please don't do that. That's bad for the public. Don't aggressively market the drug. Let experts put into place algorithms and care standards for when these drugs should be used so that they're used wisely and appropriately. Nonprofits can do that. For profits, not so much. Note that the nonprofits can get a lot of development done using existing push incentives. And if you get a drug developed to phase two or phase three clinical trials, you've de risked the molecules, you've decreased the uh, time to approval, which decreases economic discounting, which really erodes the net present value of the drugs. You might actually be able to sell a drug to industry at phase three, even if that drug is only a 50 to $100 million per year seller, because you've taken all the cost, risk, and time out of development, and they're at the last stage, and when they come in, that NPV is going to look much better. The other advantage of a nonprofit is that in contrast to for-profits, nonprofits can set pricing of drugs to make them much more available in LMIC countries. If I had a new CRE drug and I was pricing it at $500 per course, you'd have it available in LMIC countries, whereas the $10,000 courses that currently exist are not available. That's not a pipeline problem. That's a cost per unit sold problem. How do you structure the nonprofit? There's GARP out there, there are existing nonprofits, but what I'd really like to see, and not that those shouldn't continue, they should, but I'd really like to see an endowed nonprofit that lives off its endowment because it's sustainable. You put a lot of money up front to fund an endowment and you live off three, four, five percent of that endowment each year. That will give you sustainable R&D monies year after year after year to run your R&D, to pay your people and pay for your research while also leveraging existing uh, push incentives from government and other nonprofits. It's not gonna cover the cost of clinical trials. That's why you go out and get grants from BARDA or NIAID or CARBAX or wherever, wherever you go to get those push incentives to cover your other costs. Essentially in this model, the nonprofit is the bullpen. They develop drugs to lay preclinical phase one and then they don't continue developing until they're needed. And at that stage, then they can go into clinical development. We've published in the Annals of Internal Medicine a schema for where the nonprofits would fit, how the money would be get reinvested. It would partner with for-profit industry for the final stages of development and de-risk these molecules to make them more attractive to industry. I think taking a $1 billion government fund and, and putting them into found three endowed nonprofits is a much better sustainable investment that will lead to much more new antibiotics in the coming 500 years than wasting $1 billion as a gift to a company that brings one drug to market. The for-profit motive for antibiotics is past, okay? You guys can continue sticking in the bubble but you're gonna howl at the moon and you're not gonna get the legislation you want passed. You're not gonna get your multi-billion dollar subsidies. Let's switch to solutions that actually can be achieved, okay? This is a commodities market. We need less expensive solutions to slowly over years and decades sustainably deliver new antibiotics as we need them. Clinging to the past is not going to change the future. We want a small number of new drugs every few years. The future is nonprofit with careful targeting of push incentives that coexist with and help sustain 
a more limited for-profit capital market. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Brad, for an amazing talk. I have great respect for Dr. Brad and his highly idealistic view, and I do agree with a lot of his arguments. However, Dr. Brad is facing a different scenario in US than we doctors in India faces. Dr. Brad is perfectly right that, you know, many of the molecules available in the US are not available in India, and we need to fast track the process. So we have more antibiotics to treat drug resistant infections. But the other difference is in US, we have KPC type of CRE. Yes, six new antibiotics are available against CRE, but majority of them are against KPC. In India, we are facing NDM, the New Delhi metallobitalactamase type of carbapen resistant enterobacteriaceae. And the only available anti new antibody that's available in India is Saftazidim avibactam. And lots of our isolates are resistant to Saftazidim avibactam. And even if you add a strion of a synergy, plenty of the isolates are resistant. We have bugs that are resistant to all available antibiotics, including cholestin, including captazin avibactam, including with a strionum synergy. And the new drug that is active against CRE is septrocol not at available in India, and even before that's being marketed, our, our experts, microbiologists say that when they did testing, MIC testing, the MIC against CRE is high even before marketing. So we, we doctors in South Asia who face with the NDM challenge definitely needs new antibodies against CRE. And definitely we, from our perspective, we have an unmet needs. And also, we let's listen to, you know, the, the industry produces antibiotics and Let's listen to the perspective of what drug developers have to say. And Dr. Ashwini Taida is one of our trustees and an infectious disease physician from Nagpur. Dr. Ashwini will chair the next session. Dr. Ashwini. Thank you, Kapoor, sir. So Dr. Brad has explained us how government needs to directly take over antibiotic development. Now let's listen to the perspective of industry. Dr. John Rakes is an infectious disease physician and a researcher who later moved to drug development and pharmaceutical industry. He was the vice president of AstraZeneca and now he's the editor in chief of AMR Solutions. So let's just listen to Dr. John Rakes. Thanks to the organizers for the opportunity to participate in this global discussion and to share my thoughts on a pragmatic path towards creating a sustainable long-term pipeline of new antibiotics. My name is John Rex. My coordinates are shown on the slide along with my contact details. I'm quite happy to share the slides. Just brought me a note. So scope and disclosures for the talk. Just about me, you need to know that I'm an ID doc who wants new antibacterials and antifungals. And, um, I have worked over the past 30 years, both inside academia and inside regulated industry across all phases of development on a variety of agents. And as an academic, I was just, just I was a typical university professor. I was also a hospital epidemiologist. And then inside regulated industry, I've worked in large companies, small companies. I've worked with venture capital. I've worked on regulatory pathways. I've worked on the economics of antibiotics. And my focus today is on new therapies, in particular, new antibacterial therapies. I would say that better use of and access to existing and of course, future therapies and diagnostics is needed as well. But I'm gonna to talk today about creating new therapies. And I, my focus on new here uh, comes from the fact that resistance is eternal. All agents ultimately must be replaced. Let me also note that I work at F2G, a company that has a novel antifungal in development, but I'm not gonna discuss that drug at all today. So what is it that we need? Well, it's new antibiotics at intervals. Antibiotics are the fire extinguishers of medicine, but unlike real fire extinguishers, they don't last forever. And it gets helpful to start with a pop quiz. Have you used a fire extinguisher today? Now, you're gonna say, mm, probably not. Nothing caught fire while I was cooking breakfast. Well, let me actually make it a little more concrete. Are you using a fire extinguisher right now? Are you in a building? Does that building have a fire extinguisher in it? Yeah, actually you are using a fire extinguisher. You're using every bit of it except the part that gets you wet. If a fire broke out, that fire extinguisher would be there to protect you right away. And antibiotics are like fire extinguishers in that infections are like fires. 
Infections, fires go quickly. If you've got the right tool, you put out the infection, you put out the fire, you get over it. If you don't have it, lots of bad things happen. And antibiotics are really the fundamental safety net for all of medicine. Surgery, cancer therapy, taking care of premature babies, um, infrastructure for civilization. Stated differently, antibiotics have a value by existing that goes beyond their value when we put them into a human being. And this insurance-like value is something we've spent a lot of time thinking about and talking about how to measure. And I'm gonna introduce an acronym to you, STEDI, S-T-E-D-I, for five values that an antibiotic has simply by being on the shelf. And the, the details for that are shown on the slide, the sources for that. But the STEDI stands for Spectrum Transmission Enablement Diversity and Insurance. And let me just take one of them. I think transmission is the easiest one to describe. If patient number one has an infection, the bad bug, and we treat it, we put out that fire. Patient number two cannot get infected. Patient number three, patient number four, patient number five. Everybody is protected by the fact that we put out the fire on patient number one. So what's the value to patients two, three, four, and five? Well, huge potentially, but we don't pay for that. We don't recognize it. So you think about the way insurance works. What we're doing is we're buying a collective way to protect ourselves. And it's important to recognize that antibiotics don't last forever. Um, this is just one of many graphs I could have shown you. This is the emergence of fluoroquinolone resistance in E. coli in Europe between 2002 and 2020. I got this off the ECDC website. Resistance has emerged to every, every approved antibody. It's not if, but when. And resistant bacteria move around. This is a, a graphic that Marin McKenna put together in a Nature paper in 2013 showing the spread of, of a resistant gram-negative bacteria as it bopped around the world quite quickly over a period of about a decade. Unfortunately, we do not have a steady stream of new antibiotics right now. It's actually been three years since we had the most recent new antibiotic approved. So what is it we'd really like? Well, immediately we would love to have several new antibiotics right now because as the WHO has recently said, few clinically differentiated antibacterial agents are in late stage development, especially against critical priority pathogens. And the, the recent Murray, the grant report, the grant paper said that there were 1.27 million deaths attributable to bacterial AMR in 2019. Um, and then after we get at least a little bit of a toehold, um, then we'd like to have a few high impact new antibiotics every decade. And some number greater than one, probably less than 10. You, know, you can argue about the precise number. Five, six would be nice. Um, and then we want a chance to work on that class, that, that new kind of antibiotic, and improve it at least once or twice over, over time after that. And as it's not clear how often we're going to find high-impact new antibiotics, we're having them staggered in time seems helpful in managing resistance concerns. And the intrinsic difficulty with finding new agents is going to help us here. And I'm also going to discuss an idea called delinkage that will help manage this as well. The question of what is high-impact, let me put that off. I'm going to come back to it in just a bit. So let's talk about two issues. The first one is that inventing new antibiotics is really very hard. Um, and R&D focused on true novelty, you gotta start at least 20 years before you, you want the new drug. And which means that clinical development also needs to start in advance of needing the new drug. Kevin Otterson put together this slide about how long it takes to go from discovery to FDA approval. And the, the time required is enormous. 20, 20 years is actually typical when you're looking at a new class and really new classes like the new drugs for TB can ease, can, we're, we're, more, we're more than 20 years. Uh, it takes a long time to find these new agents. And this is a slide that I put together off of a, a wiki page that listed the year of approval of all antibiotics going all the way back to the arsenicals uh, in, in, in the early 1900s. Um, and the bars represent classes of drugs. And wherever place you see a little black mark, that's actually a new agent in that class. Um, and the, of the 27 discrete classes on the slide, 13 of them are singletons. That's the ones where there's just a little yellow blob on the slide. There are 14 classes with multiple drugs, and the beta-lactams are the real winners here, 67 variants as of the time of this publication. Um, how long did it take to get from the first one to the next one in the class? Somewhere between a few years and decades from the first to the last, usually many decades. And it's expensive to create these new drugs. 
the average all-in cost to creating a new drug is $1.3 billion. Now, you don't actually spend $1.3 billion on the drug that gets approved. It's all the things that came before it, all the things that failed, all the things you had to try before you got to the one that got to approval. And then if you had a brand new antibiotic, if I gave it to you right now, kind of like giving you a car in the driveway with the keys in, the, in it and the gas in the tank and say, go. In fact, if I gave you that new drug, you would be $350 million in debt right away because you're gonna to need to uh, spend $100 million in your post-approval commitments, things like pediatrics. And you're gonna spend $25 million a year to keep the gas in the car to run the plant that makes the drug. Um, and so altogether, it actually costs about $1.7 billion to create it and make it available for 10 years. And usage-based income is never going to recover that, that kind of money, nor should it, actually. We actually want to use drugs very little, as we'll discuss. And that's why new antibiotics typically have a small number of, of uh, dollar sales per year. Can you do it for less? Well, actually, no. There are no discounts or regulatory shortcuts for being small versus large, for being nonprofit versus for-profit, for degree of novelty. And I'll tell you, small company models are already very, very lean. So that brings us to core issue number two, antibiotic economics are upside down. And we're gonna revisit the idea of antibiotics as the fire extinguishers of medicine. I'd like to thank my colleague, Ralph Wagner, for this succinct shorthand for the antibiotic paradox. If you invent a bad antibiotic, use will be limited. If you invent a really good antibiotic, use will be very limited. And in both cases, the price of the antibiotic will be low by modern drug standards. The paradoxes that underlie all of this are first that from a societal perspective, development is better done prior to the epidemic. We get a drug today that we will need tomorrow. And we do this by using non-inferiority studies in standard infections. We can't deliberately do superiority studies without rampant clinical failures. And if you want to know more about, about um, superiority and non-inferiority, look on my website, amr.solutions, for links to discussions of this idea. It's really important to understand that new antibiotics, we can develop them in, in advance with non-inferiority studies and have them available when we need them. And then in terms of reimbursement, re Payment for all other drugs is based on doses administered to a patient. Makes perfectly good sense. But the greatest value of an antibiotic is often in its mere availability. Have you used a fire extinguisher today? Think back to that idea. And we also come here into the unexpected impact of stewardship on innovation. For every other new drug class, an innovative new product is rapidly taken up and receives premium pricing. For antibiotics, the most innovative products are deliberately put on the shelf by entirely rational and appropriate stewardship programs. We want to save them, okay? And so again, Kevin Otterson, I'll refer to another one of his slides, he calls this the antibiotic tripod. It speeds resistance and undermines innovation. Stewardship constrains, constrains access and undermines innovation. And innovation without access is unjust and without stewardship is wasteful. And sustainable approach to it antibiotic ecosystem. It needs to be pragmatic. It needs to include failure as an option so people can start trying an idea and when it doesn't work, move on to the next idea. And it also needs to anticipate the H problem. There's a solution that's simple, neat, and wrong. So in terms of pragmatic approaches, the global community has been talking about this for well over a decade. And the critical project was a, a project called Drive AB that ran 2014 to 2017 in Europe um, that had about 100 participants in it and from diverse disciplines, everybody from national health agencies to pharmaceutical industry to academic researchers, uh, everybody was there to talk about this problem. And Drive AB suggested four basic kinds of solutions. The first was that of an early stage grant program. And actually we have that now. Carbex and Novo Repair are a good start, but more, more funds are needed. I just know in passing that Drive AB recommended yet another $250 million a year in new push incentives uh, that's still to come. Um, Drive AB recommended that there be communication or the idea of pipeline coordination. Here I'll point at the global AMR hub and at WHO's where we'll work on reviewing pipelines. We're actually doing pretty well there, I think. And then Drive AB recommended two kinds of poll, and I'm going to focus on the first kind of poll today, substantial awards for true innovation. Um, I'll note that the next version, the one that's just shown in gray, selective funding of manufacture of older drugs, is a pretty straightforward idea. You want, once your drug is well proven that you want it available, 
and it's off patent, you could pay somebody to make the amount that you think is needed globally. So coming back to the idea of substantial awards for true innovation, um, think, you know, the idea here is if we don't have truly new agents, then emergence of resistance could shut down your ICU. And you need to think about the cost of not having that drug when you need it. So here we get into the, some important language, delinked pull awards for high impact innovation. We're going to delink the reward for innovation from the actual use of the drug. The reward will be delivered over time to ensure access and availability are met. And the example number one, the global poster child for this is the subscription pilot that the UK has been moving forward, a thing called the, sometimes called the Netflix model. The UK have done something extraordinary. They have identified two novel approved agents. They selected them based on well-defined criteria that I'm going to talk about in a second. And then they said, we are going to buy them for our citizens at 10 million pounds per year per drug for 10 years. We're going to pay 100 million pounds over the next 10 years for the drug. Doesn't matter how much we use. We're actually hoping we don't use very much, but we're going to pay this amount in order to encourage the innovator to make the drug available. And if you think about the UK as math, that turns into a statement by the UK that that drug is really worth $4 billion to the global community. A number of, of folks have looked at the what's the value and said a, a number in that range actually is what's needed to drive innovation. Example number two is a thing called the Pasteur Act, which is proposed U.S. legislation that we're hoping gets passed soon. And the idea here is similar. The U.S. government for high impact, interesting new drugs, not everything, but the high, the good ones, would pay $750 million to $3 billion for that drug over 10 years with a variety of uh, you know, constraints on it. You've got to deliver it and not, not, a number of other things. But the notion is to pay a U.S. size contribution to creating those new fire extinguishers. Global award, $4 billion over 10 years for high impact new drug is adequate to deliver, to drive innovation. And when I talk about this with the R&D community, and I, I, I say to them, look, the, the idea here is that we're, we're using pull awards to turn the R&D ship. Think of the R and think of R and D as being a twenty to thirty year long, not feet long or, or meters long, but a year long ship. Big tips, big ships turn slowly, but they do turn. Tell them what you want, and pull awards tied to desired features will turn the ship. Novelty, indications, and spectrum—all things you can measure. I'm going to show you how the UK did it on the next slide. We need to hold the targets constant. Remember, it takes 20, 30 years to invent the new drug. So you've got to tell people what you want and then kind of keep going in that direction for a period of time. And if you want an extended discussion of this, go uh, search on the website, search for DTR, Difficult to Treat Resistance. It's, a, it's an interesting way to get into this conversation and think about the value of new antibiotics. And so the, the real hint here is, what does this tell the R&D community about choosing a project? Big poll awards are only going to go to projects that make you say, wow, I want that. So you better be doing a project where at the end of it, it you, you could be getting people to say, wow, I need that drug. So here's the UK pilot point score scene. Let's sort of scan your eye through here. There's some points for pathogen coverage. There's some points for utility in various disease settings. There's points for being novel, for having different targets, a variety of different things here. I'd say all these things collectively are the Fire extinguishers, different antibiotics, don't all get the same number of points. That's an important idea as well. And we think the Pasteur Act in the United States will have a similar feel. There's going to be a committee that lays out a list of criteria and determines how much a drug would be worth. Is it worth anything? And then if it is on the, on the scale, well, how much does it get? So H.L. Mencken, for every complex problem, there's a solution that's simple, neat, and wrong. You know, you can criticize these ideas. And, and I think when you come to them for the first time, it does sound odd to be offering a, an incentive to the pharmaceutical industry to invent a drug. I'm thinking about it, you realize this is the way to get it done and actually get what you want. So let's look at some of those criticisms. Sometimes people say, wow, that sounds like a really expensive fire extinguisher. Well, uh, you know, I'm gonna say to you that what do you think the fire suppression system in your hospital actually costs? And a single use protects your entire building. And also delinkage gets us out of the question of what does it cost to you that much because the government is paying for the insurance policy that makes the, the drug available. It's only for a few patients. Well, you know, yeah, you're, you're right. In some parts of the world, resistance isn't that common yet. 
but bugs do spread. Remember that picture earlier on in the talk. And what about the 1.27 million who are dying of, of AMR right now? We actually could use some interesting new drugs right now. We shouldn't give a billion dollars for every new antibiotic. Absolutely agree. We need a high bar for the reward and only a few antibiotics are gonna earn it. And this fundamental idea is embedded in the UK pilot and in the Pasteur Act. The pipeline's better than it was 10 years ago. Well, yeah, maybe a tiny bit, you know, and the fact that the UK found a couple of interesting drugs to, to bring in, certainly it validates that, but we're still in trouble per the CDC and the WHO, and the really interesting stuff is, is only beginning to become visible in the early, the preclinical pipeline, and it's gonna take years before any of that comes to fruition. Most new antibiotics don't address unmet need. Well, actually they do address priority pathogens, but it's not surprising that by the time they get developed, they're not all equally useful or needed. And I will say that there's a, a labeling issue that limits how unmet need data around new antibiotics are, are shown. It was something we need to work on fixing, complicated and long discussion. But at the end of the day, you, you're right, not all antibiotics are equally valuable and that's an important idea. We only need a new antibiotic every few years. I agree entirely, but you don't get those few by magic. You have to work for decades in order to have them. The ecosystem has to be running constantly. And a public entity to find new drugs would be better. And this is actually the one that scares me the most. Uh, let me say, who is better at making difficult cost-benefit financial decisions, the government or the, or the private sector? And my experience with R&D is that the most important driver of success is having a way to force projects to stop. Companies and projects need to have a way to be forced to stop. And this is very hard with public institutions. That's why I would avoid this. Now, I would use a public entity to set the target profile and let private industry deliver. Now, that's, that's what NASA does. So the idea of we lay out what we want, we lay out the point scoring scheme and say, this is what we want, go get it. That actually works really well. So in summary, needed, like a help wanted sign, new antibiotics at intervals. Antibiotics are the fire extinguishers of medicine, but unlike real fire extinguishers, fundamentally new classes are needed at regular intervals. Core issue number one, inventing new antibiotics is amazingly difficult. R&D focused on true novelty takes decades and you gotta do lots of clinical development in order to get the drug available before you actually need it. And that ties into the upside down economics of antibiotics. They really are upside down and we need to start thinking about paying for antibiotics like fire extinguishers. And that leads to the, the need for a realistic, sustainable antibiotic ecosystem. Um, failure is a critical ingredient in this, and any critique of the new ideas, the, the, the Pasteur, the UK pilot, needs to come with a plausible tested alternative. It's no longer okay to be just against. You've actually got to be for something else. And we have spent, the global community has spent over a decade talking about the kinds of approaches that would actually work, pragmatic models that will give us a sustainable ecosystem. And the UK pilot and the Pasteur Act in the United States are built on these ideas. So thank you very much for having me here today. Really appreciate the opportunity to share these comments and uh, safe travels. Thank you, Dr. Riggs, for the wonderful talk. Now we have balanced view on how countries can invest in antibiotic development. We listened to Dr. Brad Spellberg's view and Dr. John Riggs view both. The policymakers in various countries should choose the best and the most practical option they find suitable. Uh, may I invite Dr. Anup Warrior, an eminent infectious disease physician and DMS at Aster Medicity, Kerala. He is also one of our trustees to chair the next session, Dr. Anup. Thank you, Ashwin. So, Good evening, all. So next in line, we have uh, Dr. Mayur Ramesh. Dr. Mayur Ramesh is an infectious physician at the Wayne State University, United States. He both a clinical and a researcher. He has dozens of clinical trials to his credit. He'll be talking to us on should we fast track clinical trials on life-saving anti-infective molecules. We have uh, Dr. Raji Jayadevan as chair. He is, uh, heads the scientific uh, session of IMA for us in Kerala. After this session, I will be inviting Dr. J Rajiv to share his comments and a few queries to him also. Now uh, we can have Dr. Mayur Ramesh on the panel, please. Hi, good afternoon to the Indian colleagues and uh, thank you to the organizers of the AMR Declaration Trust uh, webinar. And thank you to my dear friend, uh, Dr. Abdul Ghafoor for inviting me. Uh, my topic is, should we fast-track clinical trials on life-saving anti-infective molecules? Uh, I have no conflict of interest to disclose. Uh, 
the objective includes answer to the question. Uh, we're going to then talk about uh, uh, the impact of AMR and uh, how does the global antimicrobial pipeline looks like. We'll talk briefly about the FDA drug approval process and what is FDA's uh, drug ex uh, expedited drug approval program and see if there are novel uh, uh, methodologies, scientific methodologies and clinical trial methodologies that are able to help accelerate the pipeline and approval process and conclusions. To answer the question, should we fast track clinical trials on life-saving and infective molecules? The answer is a resounding yes. Why is that? Uh, cause, uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria uh, is the greatest threat to human health, according to CDC of 20, uh, uh, reported in 2019. Uh, and we are uh, losing many, many antimicrobial agents, uh, and uh, uh, we are seeing increasing uh, drug resistant pathogens. Mm -hmm. The urgent threats include Carbapenem resistant Acinetobacter, Candida auris, Clostridium difficile, Carbapenem resistant Enterobacterialis, and drug resistant Neisseria gonorrhea. And serious threats uh, include several agents, including several gram-negative and, uh, and uh, gram-positive agents uh, not in the urgent threats, such as the VRE, ESPL-producing enterobacterialis, multidrug resistant pseudomonas aeruginosa, uh, MRSA, and several other agents. What is the global impact of the problem? Uh, so in this uh, study reported in Lancet 2022, the analysis of deaths from bacterial AMR, uh, studying 23 pathogens, from 204 countries and territories uh, and studying about 471 million records and isolates, 4.95 million deaths were associated with bacterial AMR in 2019, and 1.27 million deaths was attributable to bacterial AMR. Low respiratory tract infection accounted for greater than 1.5 million deaths uh, and the most burdensome infectious syndrome and over 100,000 deaths were attributable to MRSA. So if we think COVID-19 uh, it's a huge plane, cr a plane crash. Uh, AMR uh, uh, is also a huge plane crash, except it's in slow motion. So look, looking at a uh, drug development process, FDA uh, uh, goes through the for uh, or recommends the following, which is drug discovery concept, preclinical research, clinical research, FDA review, followed by FDA post-marketing safety monitoring. So uh, in the process, uh, in, uh, in drug discovery, generally about 5,000 to 10,000 compounds are studied, uh, and then about uh, about uh, a few hundred of them are brought to preclinical uh, uh, setting, and that takes about three to six years or so. And then they, uh, 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 just a few compounds are, are taken into clinical trials through various stages of the clinical trials, and that takes about an average of six to seven years. And then eventually, uh, 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 a compound gets approved by FDA. The overall process takes anywhere between 10 to 15 years. So it's pretty tedious and uh, uh, time consuming and expensive. So uh, the traditional pathway of clinical trials uh, that go through FDA uh, are phase one, where about 20 to 100 healthy volunteers or those with disease uh, are studied for several months and the uh, end, end points are safety and, uh, and the appropriate dosage. Of the agents studied, 70% of them uh, then move on to the next phase, which is phase two, where several hundred patients with disease are studied for several months to up to two years, uh, and the endpoints are efficacy and adverse effects, and only about one third of uh, the agents studied then move on to the next phase three, where in phase three, 300 to 3,000 or a few thousand patients are studied uh, with disease, like, uh, uh, and they are studied for at least one to four years. Uh, uh, endpoints being efficacy and adverse effects, and literally only one fourth of the uh, uh, of the agents that are studied eventually are uh, approved or move and move on to what is called as phase four, where uh, which is post marketing study, where several thousand patients with disease are uh, studied for safety and efficacy. So when we look at a uh, uh, global antimicrobial pipeline in this pre COVID study uh, 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 from May of 20, until May of 2019, uh, 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 they studied about 407 preclinical antibiotic projects from about 314 institutions. The different mechanisms uh, that are being studied is the standard methodologies uh, uh, of drug targeting, which is direct acting small molecules, of which uh, which is about 46% uh, 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 of the studies were that. And uh, and in the direct acting agent, 70% were uh, uh, looking at novel drug uh, targeting and 20% uh, looking at old drug targeting. 
and uh, 50 percent were actually targeting gram negative bacteria then there were non-traditional uh, uh, antimicrobials like studies such as uh, antibodies and vaccines immunomodulators antivirulence approaches and uh, uh, more interesting phages and microbiota being studied as well when we look at institutions uh, studying a uh, um, vast majority about 81 uh, percent in this uh, uh, in the study uh, uh, were all uh, uh, from small small, small and medium-sized enterprises which has less than thousand employees big pharma only contributed to about three percent of novel drug development academic institution came second at about 12 percent and majority of these small and medium-sized uh, enterprises were located uh, in uh, in uh, USA and Canada, in North America, and some uh, in Europe, and a, a few of them, like eight of them, in India. So FDA already has existing expedited drug approval program, such as Fast Track, Accelerated Approval, Priority Review, and uh, the more recent Breakthrough Therapy. Uh, so. Uh, uh, based on uh, the AIDS epidemic in the 1980s, uh, uh, several uh, uh, initiatives were done by FDA uh, uh, to improve and bring uh, new antimicrobial agents to the market, particularly targeting uh, the HIV uh, agent, mm -hmm. such as fast track process, accelerated approval, and prior to review. Uh, uh, in 2012, uh, FDA implemented the breakthrough uh, process as well. So trying to understand them in detail, Breakthrough therapy is a process des de designed to expedite development and review of drugs, which may demonstrate substantial improvement over available therapy. Accelerated approval uh, involves regulations that allow drugs for serious conditions and that fill an unmet medical need uh, to be approved based on a surrogate endpoint rather than traditional endpoints. Prior to review uh, uh, designation means FDA's goal is to take action on an application within six months. Now, talking in detail about Fast Track, uh, Fast Track is uh, designed to facilitate the development and, ex and expedite the review of drugs uh, to treat serious uh, conditions with unmet needs. This uh, expedited process, Fast Track, was implemented under the FDA Modernization Act uh, uh, of 1997. Uh, in 2012, the FDA Safety and Innovation Act, FDA, FDA SIA, amended the fast track designation to include what is called as the GAIN Act or Generating Antibiotics Initiatives Now Act, which provided incentives. Uh, I apologize, it's Generating Antibiotics Incentives Now Act or the GAIN Act, which provided incentives to help bring new antibiotics and other antimicrobials to the market. So, um, a qualified infectious disease product, a QIDP, uh, is, de uh, uh, is designated by the authority of GAIN Act and then is eligible for fast track designation and prior to review. So in this process, four new antimicrobial agents were approved in 2014. Uh, the latest initiative is the Limited Population Antibacterial Drug Pathway or LPAD. It was authorized as, as part of the 21st Century Cures Act 2016. And it's a regulatory improvement that provides an unique mechanism for FDA to review and approve new antibiotics specifically for use in patients with unmet medical needs. So for an agent to be part of fast track, it has to, uh, uh, to address the unmet need or show increasing advantage over available therapy, such as superior effectiveness or improved effect on serious outcomes, obviously avoiding serious side effects uh, uh, and decreasing clinical significant toxicity so that uh, there is, uh, it causes less discontinuation of uh, treatment and the ability to address emerging or anticipated public health need. There are many benefits to FDA fast track designation, such as uh, allowance for frequent meetings with FDA mm, along the way to discuss drugs development, uh, development plan, uh, more frequent written communications from FDA, eligibility for accelerated approval and priority review, and what is called as a rolling review, which means uh, traditionally a biologic license application and NDA, new drug application for review, mm, uh, uh, is reviewed only after every aspect of NDA is completed, but with rolling review, with each portion of the uh, 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 application being completed, review is done. So this allows for fast tracking of uh, uh, FDA process, uh, approval process. So let's look at some novel ways of accelerating the uh, uh, antimicrobial pipeline and approval process. So we can increase uh, uh, this by 
increasing the level of diversity and novel scientific approaches, can focus more on CDC and WHO critical priority pathogens, and we can develop non-traditional antibacterial agents such as phages. And of course, we need funding, uh, but we cannot rely on large pharma funding alone. Uh, as, as I showed, only 3% of large pharma uh, was doing uh, antimicrobial uh, research. Uh, so public and philanthropic funding is sorely needed uh, to accelerate the pipeline. So uh, uh, when you look at scientific methodologies, in the golden era uh, of uh, antibiotics from 1930s to say about 1970s uh, 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 and beginning of 1980s, um, uh, about uh, 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 several antimicrobial agents were, uh, 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 were uh, approved and used. And at the time, the technology was not as advanced as it is now. Currently, there are novel technologies uh, such as mass spec or Malditov, several sequencing technologies, including next generation technologies that are available. Using these technologies, we can identify several novel uh, uh, gene targets and other uh, drug targets. Uh, but unfortunately, there is still an antibiotic innovation gap. So. Uh, using novel technologies uh, such as genome mining, heterologous expression, untargeted metabolomics, and targeted metabolomics, we can do. We can easily bring new antibiotics uh, to the market. And uh, not in this slide uh, is where uh, there are uh, uh, pathway uh, analysis and artificial intelligence that can also be used uh, to bring more, more and more. Uh, very, very specific uh, antimicrobial agents mm, uh, to the target, and uh, uh, that has almost guarantee of uh, clinical success. Uh, so the other ways is improving clinical trials, uh, such as novel trial design, maybe the uh, uh, such as the adaptive design. And uh, so during the COVID pandemic, uh, uh, one of the mm, famous trials, the recovery trial, uh, is an adaptive design trial where. Based on interim analysis, uh, we modified the uh, trial without interfering with the integrity of data or mm, introducing any bias. Uh, accelerated uh, approval after extended phase two uh, may be a strategy uh, uh, for regulatory agents to try to bring new drugs to the market fast. And approval can be based on surrogate endpoints rather than traditional endpoints. And approval can be based on interim analysis of data, that, uh, and, and then final approval can be given after a full analysis is done uh, 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 at a subsequent time point. And clearly, during COVID-19, clinical trial uh, uh, transparency was key uh, uh, to, for uh, uh, both uh, uh, institutions and uh, 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 regulatory bodies and patients uh, to have confidence uh, uh, with the agents that are being uh, brought into the market. WHO plays a significant role in AMR, and in April of 2021, uh, it published a newsletter where it said, global shortage of innovative antibiotics fuels emergence and spread of drug resistance. And WHO has several initiatives to, uh, uh, to address this problem for development of novel antimicrobials, such as Drugs for Neglected uh, Disease Initiative, and set up the, uh, and along uh, with this, they set up the Global Antibiotic R&D Partnership, uh, the GARDP. They, are they set up collaboration with nonprofit funding partners, such as CARBEX. Then uh, the latest initiative is the AMR Action Fund, which is a coalition of uh, pharmaceutical companies, philanthropies, European Investment Bank, and the WHO, and uh, designed mm, to bring in novel drugs to the market early. So in conclusion, AMR is a public health emergency, and fast track of antimicrobials uh, is essential as a key mitigation uh, strategy. Advances in scientific methods described uh, in the talk uh, allows for fast track of preclinical agents and the ability to predict success in clinical setting rather than uh, uh, bringing baseful uh, agents uh, uh, into the clinical trial processes. Innovative trial design and other trial strategies, uh, uh, such as the adaptive trial design, for example, will bring novel antimicrobials to the market more successfully uh, than conventional and traditional trial design. And of course, academic private and public partnerships for funding trials are sorely needed. So thank you very much, and I'll take further questions at this point of time. 
good evening and uh, thank you dr mayur so so uh, dr rajiv and i would like to invite you now to for your comments so two things specifically maybe if you can illustrate one is do you think this this uh, fast forward clinical trials will have any serious ethical concerns in our setting two do you think the funding which uh, dr mayur spoke about from various categories do you think that it will materialize in our setting do we have hope for that kind of activity in india yes uh, thank you uh, dr anup warrior and uh, it is a pleasure to listen to dr ramesh's talk uh and uh, i enjoyed his his pace of speaking which is quite uh, um uh quite good for understanding all the points and the slides were clearly laid out so make some notes here so dr ramesh talked about how um depending on the need of the world we might need to move a little faster than we would normally do and uh, there's no better teacher than the pandemic we saw how um the vaccines got rolled out um in on a faster scale uh, not only the vaccines as dr ramesh said the recovery trial which is one of the major uh, turning points uh, academic turning points in the covid pandemic that gave us a lot of new information and a lot of valuable information as to what worked and what did not work so uh, so since the pandemic we are now wiser that we need to upgrade and update some of the existing paradigms of um, drug approval so clearly there is a need at this point because we saw from the icmr report as well as the lancet report uh, that antimicrobial resistance in spite of infections overall going down due to mitigation measures in the last two years has really gone up uh, but that's also partly driven by excessive antibiotic use uh, during the pandemic for other reasons as well so uh, clearly there is a need and the as, as your second question is about the funding i am no expert on funding but i will say i'll echo the previous speaker's words that there must be a a public agency an agency that is perhaps funded by public funds that is solely in charge that's put in charge of such development so uh, they will be in a better position to make these things happen in the long run so i remember uh, sitting with dr anup warrior i think 7 years ago at um, your hospital and we had a close meeting with some international experts on this very topic antimicrobial resistance and you put out a publication after that i recall um the hospital infection control committees have to um uh, talk to each other one problem that i see as a practicing doctor on the ground is that doctors tend to work in bubbles and that uh we encountered that problem during the pandemic as well because it is it is not okay to work in bubbles that is something that we through the indian medical association try to break down the barriers between uh communication between doctors and uh, uh the pandemic actually taught us we are all much wiser now thanks to coordinated work so i think uh, uh we must really break out of these bubbles and share publications share data uh i, I sit on our own hospitals uh, infection control committees uh uh panel discussions but we don't really share any data so i think we should we should make, bring bring forward the change from within ourselves and i'll end by saying one more thing here that there is today uh, interestingly happens to be world toilet day and uh, for uh, the viewers who might be wondering what the toilet has to do with world toilet day has to do with today's topic uh we know that in addition to prescribing of antibiotic Uh, it is also the sewage disposal or the sanitation that has a major role in uh, how much antibiotic resistance happens specifically when bacteria get excreted by humans and animals where do they go uh, they are able to we know that they are able to transfer their technology the genes to other bacteria in the environment and they can find their way back to through um, through uh, our crops uh, through water so uh, the world toilet day uh, 2022 today uh, has that particular theme in mind so it so happened that to coincide with our webinar today that sewage and sanitation sewage disposal and sanitation uh, are important considerations and one other point was already mentioned here the veterinary aspect which i'm sure dr gill has covered in some detail i will stop now thank you thank you so much dr rajiv so two points what i take back from your summary is one it's not okay to work in bubbles or silos an extremely important thing of partnership and collaboration and sharing and the second is about the importance of basic hygiene uh, and how that will contribute to control of amr in the one health perspective 
Thank you. So we will move on to the next session and uh, I will invite Dr. Yamuna Devi here. She is the consultant microbiologist and infection control for Apollo Chennai. Dr. Yamuna, over to you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Anup. Uh, I would like to uh, welcome Dr. Nitin Bansal, uh, who is a consultant in uh, Rajiv Gandhi Cancer Institute and also a um, consultant in ICMR for the Antimicrobial Stewardship Project. So the next talk would be on the excellent uh, antimicrobial resistance surveillance network, which ICMR has created uh, by having data which is shared from both public as well as uh, from private uh, sectors based on which certain tr uh, treatment guidelines have also been projected, uh, which has definitely worked out well for uh, many set up in creating their antibiotic policy. I would now request Dr. Nathan to share his ideas and also present the ICMR surveillance network data. Over to you, Dr. Nathan. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to thank Dr. Gafur sir, and who is the managing trustee of this AMR Declaration Trust and other trustees for giving me the opportunity to speak in this wonderful conference. Secondly, I would like to thank Dr. Kamini Walia for allowing me to present ICMR data. And uh, also, I understand that uh, Dr. Kamila Madam and Dr. Chandrakul sir also chairs to this session, and uh, they have been an integral component of this ICMR network. So I would appreciate if they could comment after I finish my presentation. With this, I will share my screen and uh, proceed with my presentation. I do not have any conflicts of interest to declare. Uh, I understand that most of the people may be aware of the ICMR antimicrobial resistance surveillance network. So, but since everyone will have a varied uh, uh, audience and should everyone be on the same page, I will just describe how this network works. This network was started in 2013 and it has got 20 regional centers and four nodal centers, four nodal centers uh, being PGI Chandigarh, Ames, Delhi, uh, Jipmer, Pondicherry, and CNC Bellor, and 20 regional centers. As you can see from the photograph, these centers are distributed all across the country from uh, north to south to east to west. And basically, what they do is they, they track resistance trends in various isolates from the from their own centers. And also, of lately, they have started doing whole genome sequencing and resistance pattern study uh, based on the genetic studies. So the regional centers, which generally carry out only AMSTs, whereas the nodal centers do the resistance pattern 60 isolates uh, 60 resistant isolates per species are sent to the regional uh, from the regional centers to the nodal centers and molecular characterization is done by the nodal centers so i will be presenting the highlights or the important components of the recent report which was which was which is available on the icmr website this report is uh, it basically compiles of data from compiles data from january 1st 2021 to december 31st 2021 and it is and it has studied over just under one lakh it is 95000 isolates uh, and the report has been made out of these isolates so as you can see the most common and i mean we can understand we all know that the most common isolate is going to be e coli and that is where it is e coli is the most common isolate overall but as you can see from the photograph the in when it comes to the icu isolate the most common isolate is acinetobacter baumani predominantly gram negative e coli klebsiella pseudomonas with some uh, with some gram positive in terms of staph aureus and enterococcus species so uh, concentrating on the gram negative which is which are the hotbed of antimicrobial resistance as you can see the uh, carbapenem resistance pattern in e coli have actually uh, worsened uh, in 2016 if you look at the trend the carbapenem susceptibility was around 14 percent now it has come down to uh, 36 uh, come down to carbon resistance has moved up from 14 percent to in 2016 to, to uh, 36 percent in 2021 and for for klebsiella pneumonia also carbapenem resistance pattern has increased from 35 percent in 2016 to around 45 percent uh, around 55 percent in 2021 so this is alarmingly high resistance pattern in enterobacterials again the situation is even worse in in case of acetobacter where carbon resistance is around 87.5 percent in 2021 uh coming to non uh, like some more common clinical syndromes like diarrhea and all uh, where these resistance pattern is better but uh, if you can see the norfloxacin susceptibility which is the most commonly antibiotic antibody which is prescribed for a common community acquired diarrhea uh, the susceptibility to this antibiotic is quite 
poor in terms of for E. coli, Shigella, and Salmonella. Although it works for Aromonas and Vibrio. Uh, in the network or the isolate study in the network for Salmonella typhi, it showed 100% susceptibility to Cephalosporin and Azithromycin. But we understand that there are few reports of Cephalosporin or third, third generation resistance to, uh, I mean, Salmonella typhi resistant to third generation Cephalosporin. Other common antibiotics which are used for Salmonella typhi or Salmonella paratyphi are showed good susceptibility like chloramphenicol, trimethoprim, sulfamethoprim, and MPC. Now, internationally, although we generally study uh, resistance as carbapenem resistance and ESB as producer, but internationally, the more approved definitions are MDR and XDR. So, this is the definition for MDR, which is defined as non susceptibility to one or more agents in three or more antimicrobial agents. And if you take this definition and apply this to the report, we see this is the resistant trends in various important gram negatives uh, E. coli, Acidobacter, Klebsiella pneumonia, and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. As you can see, there are worrisome MDR trends in Acidobacter pneumonia and worrisome MDR trends in Klebsiella pneumonia. For Pseudomonas, the trend is slightly on the better side. The resistance, the prevalence of MDR among Pseudomonas is slightly on the decreasing side. And for MDR E. coli, the trend is almost stable. But it is quite worrisome in MDR Klebsiella and MDR Acidobacter. And this is the definition for XDR, extensive drug resistant, where uh, all the one of the agent in all the five classes is resistant. If you apply this definition again, the trend is almost similar. What very uh, heartening or very alarming trend in acinetobacter, where the trend is also increasing, and the percentage of XDR is almost fifty percent. Again, in Klebsiella pneumonia, also we see slightly downward trend, but again the difference is not much. Pseudomonas aeruginosa, the trend is steady, and and E. coli, the trend of XDR is also steady over the course of the last three to four years. Coming to gram positive, we generally don't speak about gram positive, but they are also having a worrisome trend. Although the rate of isolation of gram positive from an Indian patient is slightly lower than, uh, than gram negatives, but the resistance pattern in gram positives is also worrisome. MRSA rates have started have increased uh, dramatically from 28.4% in 2016 to 42.6% in uh, 2021. Uh, although the anti MRSA drugs work quite well till now, encomycin and aptomycin, glenozolid also. But then again, com coming to enterococcus again, the res resistance rates is quite high. VRE rates around 37.5% in enterococcus. So that's also a, quite a disturbing rate as far as resistance pattern in gram positive also are concerned. Fungals, again, fungal pathogens have started, have become increasingly more important. Although tropicalis and albicans remain the most common candida isolated from the Indian isolates, and they remain fairly susceptible to fluconazole also, but we are seeing increasing trends of isolation of non albicans non tropical candida, that is candida auris and parapsulosis, where the uh, percentage of these isolates have increased. Like it, it was this 0.04% in 2017, that is auris, and is increased to 0.2% in 2021. Parapsulosis have increased from 023 to 3%. And as you can understand, these candidates are generally resistant to azoles. Uh, other thing is that. Uh, Again, de declining susceptibility trends in candida perhaps and candida glabrata in terms of uh, they are generally resistant, fluconazole resistance is around 75 to 80 percent. Aspergillus flavors remains the most common species among aspergilluses. Aspergillus rises, rise, sorry, rhizopus arises the most common mucre. And uh, another thing which troubles a lot as a clinician, which we can tell is that uh, dermatophytosis, which is a common skin fungal infection. Uh, Turbinafin resistance is quite high in this kind of is in this fungi, and itraconazole susceptible patterns are quite good as per the report from the ICMR. Coming to healthcare associated infections, ICMR also studies separately healthcare associated infections, and you can predict in in the blood. Yeah, we have just taken the blood. Uh, I just took out the slide for the bloodstream infections only uh, for urine. I didn't take out. As you can see, most common that is around seventy three percent isolation from gram negatives. And rest of this that is gram positive in the fungi. Among the gram negative, the most common is Klebsiella and closely followed by Acinetobacter baumani, and which is then followed by Pseudomonas and E. coli. So, most two, in more than two thirds of the patients uh, who develop BSIs after hospital admission is generally gram negative. This is B, uh, incidence, sorry, uh, prevalence of organisms in COVID patients who got BSI, uh, healthcare associated BSI. And as you can see, most of the trends are similar except for two bacteria, where we can see that isolation of Acinetobacter baumani is significantly higher among COVID isolates, and also isolation of Candida is also significantly higher. The rest of the isolation, rest of the uh, microbial spectrum is almost similar. 
so as i said earlier uh, icmr also does the netfrog also does genomic surveillance of various important isolates particularly gram negatives so i'll speak about uh, four important gram negatives e coli klebsiella pseudomonas acid defector among the e coli 273 isolates were studied this year i mean 2021 and uh, the more the highlights of this genomic report is that most common esbl ctxm 15 and the most common mc cit uh, most common carbapenemase is surprisingly imp it's not ndm it's not oxide is imp and uh, although ndm is closely followed second by the imp but the most common is imp among the e coli isolates coming to klebsiella 290 209 isolates were studied and most common esbl were shv followed by tem and among the carbapenemase most common was oxa 48 and then followed closely by ndm so this is something which we need to understand when we talk about therapy therapeutics and drug development among the pseudomonas the most characteristic thing is that we studied almost 879 pseudomonas isolates and then out of which 222 was carbapenem resistant uh, most important thing or striking point which basically uh, is important from indian perspective is that the prevalence of ndm in the pseudomonas itself and nowhere in the world that you will find such high prevalence of ndm in the pseudomonas so any drug development or any new drug which comes and which which we think that it's going to be a good pseudomonas drug we need to consider whether it has an anti ndm activity or not so this is something which is very striking in pseudomonas among the acinetobacter baumeni 563 isolates were studied and oxa 23 like uh, carbapenemase was the most common but again many of these isolates were co producers they had more than one mechanism of resistance and again ndm was quite common in all these three although oxa 23 was the most common so uh the as with anything there are strength and weaknesses so just to give give you a perspective there many strength to this icmr report one of more the major strength is it's a high quality data which comes out to the comes out from the labs of stalwarts of microbiology so the data is quite reliable high quality and it's made through standard operating procedures and it basically represents all over the country as you saw showing the initial slides uh, isolates are taken from all all parts of the country and then they are accumulated and uh, report is finalized and we have started doing genetic data also that is also an interesting component to this uh, report it generates it helps us in getting high quality evidence for amr and also for future de development just for example which i gave initially that all the anti pseudomonas drug needs to have an anti ndm activity if they want to if it is going to be working in india but there are some limitations one of the major limitations is that most of this data comes from tertiary care centers so tertiary care is over represented and since we understand tertiary care means most of the people who are already exposed to antibiotics get referred to this patient to this hospitals and then samples are taken from this hospitals and then the susceptible pattern is antibiotic secreted so tertiary care will have some bias where the resistance pattern will be higher than the general primary or secondary care that is one of the major limitations second is we don't as of now we don't have a clinical information or this lack of information clinical outcomes of this patient which is also quite important and third is i am speaking in 2020 end of 2022 about a 2021 report so all, already this report is one year old so this we don't have a live dashboard like we had in covid this is some of the limitation which i understand from the inside i can say that we are working on these limitations uh, we are already trying to accumulate an anti background from secondary secondary care hospitals and uh, uh, what i can assure you that the anti background is fairly good better than the tertiary care centers and we are also working on getting the clinical information from about this ndr isolates or xdr isolates so that we can make some clinical uh, intent into this information uh, with this i'll stop and i will hand over the mic to dr kamila madam and dr chandru for the valuable inputs and comments thank you dr nitin for that collaborative lecture on uh, icmr data and uh, really the data looks so alarming particularly when we look into the gram negative bacteria and the high uh, rate of acinetobacter in the icu now i would like to invite dr kamila uh, hod microbiologist from uh, hinduja hospital ma'am is one of the doins um, among the microbiologist who has done lot of work related to tuberculosis and their uh, microbial resistance pattern ma'am uh, kindly give your expert opinion on this icmr data and also how can we collaborate the uh, data from the primary and secondary healthcare centers too over to you ma'am thanks <clears throat> thank you yamuna can you hear me can you hear me yes ma'am you are audible I think clearly this the ICMR the AMR is and is clearly a step in the right direction. It's used uh, data, albeit it from with a uh, bias 
towards uh, tertiary care centers, but it's used local evidence um, so that you can base your guidelines for your policy on, on your cumulative antibiograms. It's been really useful and participating in it has really helped because you can actually online see your data, compare it to others. So there have been a lot of advantages to it and it really fulfilled that gap that we, we had in this had before 2013 when we didn't have any national data. Uh, so one thing is clearly the challenges are that we need to achieve this on a scale at tertiary and, and district level centers. But again, the problems are most of them don't have microbiology. And how do you wish, you know, you ensure quality? Uh, one point I could add, and that is when we make our antibiotic policies based on this data, we've actually, with the, with the staff that we got out of this project, we actually looked at risk stratifying our data. And we found that made wonderful add-on to our policy that was clearly endorsed by our physicians. For example, when we teased out the data for BSI, employing uh, you know, stratified risk for each patient, that means every patient that went into, the, into, the anti, uh, into this data, we actually rang up the patient, asked for five factors. Was he hospitalized before? Was he, did he have antibiotics before? What was his comorbidity? Did he have invasive devices? And most importantly, was he community? Was this infection community acquired or hospital acquired? And with that, we could tease out the data and actually say for our BSI, Salmonella type B in the wards was the commonest isolate. Whereas, you know, E. coli was the commonest isolate from Eurosepsis in, say, the ICU. So, and also we had, had nice data which said that Ultimately, when your patient came in from the community who was a type one with no risk, with no hospitalization, he didn't have a carbapenemase on board. The carbapenemases were nil, despite the fact that we've done a study with, with Abdul Ghafoor where we showed that the carriage is possible in the community, but they were not getting sick or they were not exposed to that. So these points, I think, are important when you go into making a policy for your hospital. But under Ma'am, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, sure. Okay. So those are my couple of points. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much for your uh, valuable comments. May I invite Dr. Ashwini to chair the next session? Thanks, Yamuna. Uh, next session, for next session, I invite Dr. Balaji. Dr. Balaji is one of the prominent figures in the field of microbiology. He is HOD of microbiology at CMC Vellore. Dr. Balaji will speak on current status of resistance in bacterial world and the need for new molecule. Dr. Balaji. Good morning, everyone. I wish to talk for the next few minutes on the current status of resistance in bacterial world and the need for new molecules. As you all know that India is the epicenter of antimicrobial resistance in the world. And the resistance scenario in India is quite unique. It's unlike what they see the resistant profile in America or in Europe, it's not seen in India. So most of the solutions required for US and Europe is not the solution for India. That's why I put it here as Resistance scenario in India is unique, therefore warrants exceptional solution. And uh, in one line, if I have to say how different it is, one, the profile, percentage of profile is very, very high. And second thing is the resistant mechanism is quite different. You can see from this slide that the difference between the Americas and the India. In uh, North America, the carbapenem resistant enterobacterial is than 3%, while in India, the carbapenem resistant enterobacterial is approximately 30%. Again, carbapenem resistant pseudomonas aeruginosa is approximately 25% in America, while in India, and again, carbapenem resistant acinetobacter baumene is around 40% in America, while in India, it is 90 percent so you can see so much of a difference in the percentage of resistant in india and what is the resistant mechanism how different it is from the western countries look here for enterobacterials more than 80 percent of the carbapenem resistant e coli to 
New Delhi metallo beta lactamase and penicillin binding protein 3 insert is there. So this is not the case elsewhere. It's predominantly KPC or OXA 48. And then uh, close to 50% persistent Klebsiella pneumoniae is due to New Delhi metallo beta lactamase and OXA 181 slash 232. Either of this one variant is there. So like in a two carbapenemase combined. So again, it's and very, very rarely we do see KPC, otherwise it's term deemed, it's very rare. Moving to Pseudomonas serogenosa, more than 80% of the carbapenem resistance is due to metallobeta lactamase. Very recently we are seeing that the NDM is overtaking the VIM. Then Acinetobacter baumannii, the NDM, usually in most of the countries they do report OXA-23 as the cause of type of carbapenemase here in India in addition to OXA 23 we do see NDM uh, this is emerging and the cholesterol resistant is emerging in Acinetobacter baumannii well we started noticing penicillin binding protein 3 mutation in Acinetobacter baumannii so it's very clear here cutting across various cla uh, taxonomical class Enterobacterials are non like all the groups in addition to the regular resistant mechanism, New Delhi metallobeta lactamase is co harbored. And for sure, you all know that we don't, as of now, have beta lactamase inhibitor, which is specific for New Delhi metallobeta lactamase. Now I move on to talk about the novel antibiotics targeting carbapenem resistant organism approved by FDA. So there are quite a few uh, drugs available in uh, Western countries, which has not yet come to India. So if it comes to India, is it going to be useful for our situation? That is the question. So now here I've listed four beta lactam, beta lactamase inhibitor which have been approved by FDA for use for worldwide. Uh, they, all the, except the ceftazidum, avibactam, the remaining three beta-lactam, beta-lactam to come to India. And look at the profile, ceftalozin, tazobactam, uh, it does have, it, the drug has no role for India. It doesn't take care of NDM in the carbapenem resistant enterobacterials, oxa enterobacterials, Again, NDM, OXA48, both put together in the enterobacterials, NDM positive, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, NDM, OXA23 positive, uh, Acinetobacter baumannii. Ceftazidum avibactam, however, is quite effective only for OXA48, like CRS, that includes 181 and 232. Miropinum babobactam, again, same story, not effective against any of the class of enzymes, carbapenemase, carbapenemase, producing organisms. Imipenum relibactum, again same. It doesn't work cutting across all the uh, organisms secreting metallobeta lactamase or OXA. So the emerging data shows that the uh, cephalorocol is not very promising to India. So there is an, a limited activity against the ND. Clapsella pneumoniae, and as well, there is no adequate data uh, to talk about the NDM Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Uh, so, as of now, no data yet for cephalorocal activity against Indian Acinetobacter baumannii isolates. Here, I specifically say Indian Acinetobacter baumannii isolates because here, in addition to OXA 23, NDM is co harbored. Co -harbored. So, in this cephalorocal, you can see that. Uh, it's not uh, very effective against the NDM CRE because of the BB3 presence in E. coli. However, it's good for OXA48. Like again, when two carbapenemases are there, both the NDM and OXA48, like then its efficacy comes in. After all, cephalorocal is a cephalosporin. Then its a role uh, in Pseudomonas aeruginosa is very limited data. Is there? We don't know in India, as you know that the NDM is present in Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And again, uh, crab, not much data is available. Moving on to the 
next class of drug that is omidacycline and erevacycline for in the indian context so the utility for urinary tract infection and the bloodstream infection could be very limited because uh, tetracycline groups are not uh, reliable for are not uh, indicated in the situations uh, very promising is the erevacycline potent activity in vitro is seen against uh, carbapenem resistant acinetobacter baumeni and uh, as well the real world clinical data is limited for erevacycline against uh, carbapenem resistant acinetobacter baumeni causing nosocomial pneumonia so we have to wait and uh, wait for the in, in vivo data or clinical trials or clinical experience but however as of now erevacycline seems to be very promising uh, in vitro promising for carbapenem resistant acinetobacter baumeni uh, definitely so far we know for sure that omidacycline is inferior to erevacycline so erevacycline is uh, another drug which we look forward for uh, potential uh, role in saving many lives plasmomycin uh, we had experience with this uh, drug uh, uh, in vitro experience uh, we have uh, 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 determined uh, MIC values of plasmomycin against carbapenemase producing E. coli and Klebsiella. Unfortunately, what we have seen is in Indian E. coli and Klebsiella pneumonia, along with the carbapenemase, the, these bugs are co-harboring 16S RMPAs. And in our study, we saw 47% of the E. coli and 38% of the Klebsiella pneumonia had this both the enzymes together and this has impacted the plasmomycin and again uh, to tell you uh, it has no role for in pseudomonas arachinosa or acinetobacter baumeni however uh, its role is 50 50 in ndm cre oxa 48 like cre and the ndm oxa 48 together that's the story about the plasmomycin now i move on to the approved drug to the phase 3 trial completed drugs but they are yet to file for the new drug application with the fda what are all the promising drugs available the number one promising drug is the cefepime taniborbactam here you know taniborbactam has an excellent activity against metallo beta lactamase in vitro however recently when we did in ndm positive isolates we couldn't see the same expected result as desired uh, we felt that this could be due to the addition of pb3 insert in equally along with the ndm and the, again uh, it's quite challenging to see susceptible mic value when the ndm and oxa 48 like is both present uh, this is for enterobacterials and no data on activity against the ndm pseudomonas aeruginosa is seen so in all lot whole cefepime taniborbactam uh, it's plus i will show you in the next slide the, our experience and the oxa 48 seems to be uh, the best target for cefepime taniborbactam while ndm and oxa 48 not sure maybe or maybe or may not uh, however its role for ndm carbapenem resistant pseudomonas aeruginosa data is not available and definitely against carbapenem resistant acinetobacter baumeni, it doesn't work. This is our data where we conducted uh, uh, against carbapenem resistant E. coli clubsella with the cefepime taniborbactam. We don't have a clinical breakpoints for cefepime taniborbactam, so we have taken the cefepime MIC level of 8 milligram per liter as a susceptible breakpoint and below and uh, equal to and below eight is considered as susceptible anything above eight is considered as non-susceptible we have chosen selectively the ndm and pb3 insert positive e coli a total number of 211 isolates were tested and we found among the 211 only 12 percent of the isolates were susceptible the remaining 88 were non-susceptible then moving on to the totally 131 isolates were tested this all these isolates add 
52 and uh, it was a uh, good excellent result was seen where 100 percent all the isolates were susceptible to cefepim tanibobactam with less than 8 milligram per liter then we had a third group where ndm and oxa 181 232 either 181 or 232 was there and the totally 121 isolates were tested of the of the 122 only 19 percent were susceptible the remaining 81 were non-susceptible so it's very clear the cefepim tanibobactam is a very useful only for clubsella pneumonia with oxa type enzymes but definitely uh, as we expect the tanibobactam to have an uh, good activity against uh, new delhi metal of beta lactamase is definitely missing moving on to the the new another new drug sulbactam darulobactam against carbapenem resistant acinetobacter baumeni very recently maybe four five weeks back uh, they have published their clinical uh, phase three clinical trial information uh, definitely, uh, it has got an uh, this uh, sulbactam darulobactam has got a potent activity against uh, OXA 23 that is present in the acinetobacter baumeni, carbapenem resistant acinetobacter baumeni. But unfortunately, in India, along with OXA 23, NDM is also present. So, in that situation, uh, it looks that sulbactam darulobactam may not be useful for Indian setting. Uh, so it will be useful only when it is OXA-23 alone is there and we have done the molecular docking experiments and we found as long as only OXA-23 is there, this will be an excellent drug. Addition of NDM presence may not look uh, very effective. Next, uh, cefepime and metasobactam uh, this is not for the carbapenemase resistant organism. This is a choice for the ESBL or I can call it as carbapenem sparing agent. Uh, this is an, uh, they have recently completed, sorry, quite a few, uh, few months back, they have completed a global phase three complicated urinary tract infection trial. And they found out that this combination seems to be superior to piprazolin tazobactam. Uh, interestingly, this n metasobactam was invented and the preclinical development was done at Orchid Pharma in Chennai. Uh, however, this combo is not active against carbapenem resistant organism, as I mentioned to you earlier. So definitely it has no role for carbapenemase producing organism. It's useful only for ESBL producing carbapenemase negative organisms. So now I have completed the uh, phase three clinical trial, completed uh, new drugs, but they are yet to file FDA. Now I wish to talk about the antibiotics which are in the phase three development. So the most interesting and promising, and uh, to some extent people are thinking that cefepime zidibactam may be a game changer. This cefepime zidibactam is a beta-lactam, beta-lactam enhancer. It's not an, a beta-lactam inhibitor, beta-lactam is inhibitor. Uh, zidibactam, the beta-lactam enhancer, has got a, a dual role. One is it has got an, a class A and class C inhibitor action. In addition to that, it has got an, a potent gram-negative penicillin binding protein to inactivating agent. And... Uh, when the zidibactam is combined with the cefepime, uh, the beta-lactam enhancer mechanism comes into play where penicillin binding protein 2 and penicillin binding protein 3 synergy occurs, thus bringing the MIC level much, much lower than the earlier standalone cefepime alone. So, uh, the, it has got an excellent broad spectrum coverage. Uh, as of now, it's expected to work well against uh, all these four components. This includes NDM, PB3 insert E. coli, NDM plus OXA48 like carbapenem resistant enterobacterials, then NDM pseudomonas aeruginosa, carbapenem resistant acinetobacter baumeni, that is, that in, has the NDM along with OXA23. So, as of now, in vitro data are very promising. We need to 
uh, wait for the phase one clinical trial. Now, uh, we did uh, some in vitro work on the activity of cefepime zinibactam against MDR E. coli isolates, arboring a novel mechanism of resistance based on the four amino acid, acid inserts in PB3. So, I would like to share the result with you. This is the study uh, data. We have not yet published. This has been submitted to antimicrobial agent and chemotherapy, awaiting for the result. And here I will show you the MIC uh, profile between the cefepime zidibactam and the cefepime tanibobactam in the same isolates. We have taken the breakpoint uh, as 8 milligram per liter because that is the original breakpoint for cefepime. So in NDM E. coli, out of 211 isolates, the MIC is 0.5 milligram per liter while in cefepime tiny bore bactam it is 64 and above so it works very well for ndm e coli again against oxa 181 and 232 klebsiella pneumoniae of the 131 isolates the mic 90 is 2 for cefepime zd bactam 4 for cefepime tiny bore bactam and Against the NDM OXA 181 and 232 Klebsiella pneumoniae of the 122 isolates, cefepime zidibactam MIC 90 was 8 milligram per liter, while in cefepime tiny bactam it's more than 64. So it looks that beta lactam enhancer based cefepime zidibactam is distinctly better, especially for NDM organism. So definitely, uh, when it compared to zidibactam and tiny bactam. Uh, Zidibactam scores over multifold. So uh, between these two, we are looking forward for cefepime zidibactam as a next promising agent for Indian situation. And uh, what we are expecting for long, still yet to come to the market from the house of Pfizer is the Astrona mavibactam. It is essentially uh, very good for carbapenem resistant enterobacteria, that way especially for Klebsiella pneumoniae but not for E. coli. I will tell you what, why not for E. coli. Uh, because in E. coli, uh, NDM plus PB3 insert uh, is not very effective uh, against, sorry, uh, Astronom avibactam is not very effective against PB3 harboring E. coli. So, uh, though for uh, overall for CRE, which is enterobacterials for both E. coli and the Klebsiella, Astronom avibactam will be there, but comprehensively some may not be there. A slight decrease, especially for E. coli, it will be there, but not for the Klebsiella. Uh, Klebsiella either with the NDM or OXA48 or with both, because in Klebsiella we don't see the PB3 insert. Only in E. coli PB3 inserts are seen. However, this Astriona may be factor may not be very great for carbapenem resistant as Pseudomonas aeruginosa, because the Astriona will be effluxed by Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Again, the Astriona may be bactam has no role in carbapenem resistant Acerutobacter baumene. So, I move on to the next uh, class of antibiotics that is polymyxin analog in clinical development. Uh, what we have realized over the years is poly polymyxins has got a broad spectrum bactericidal activity, but unfortunately, two important factors which pulls it down is one is the nephrotoxicity and second one is achieving a steady state serum concentration to bring about an effective change. So these two uh, disadvantage eluding the polymixins uh, uh, as a best drug for uh, effective antibiotic action is missing. So uh, what many companies are trying to do is they are trying to modify the polymyxins so that the acute kidney injury is avoided as well as steady state serum is achieved. So various modifications of polymyxin in these two aspects are being carried out. In that, in the earlier stage, uh, Spiro Diagnostics and Cupex Diagnostics have uh, succeeded and they have entered the phase one development stage. And especially the Spiro, the analog called the SPR206, they claim a wide coverage uh, of carbapenem resistant enterobacteria, pseudomonas aeruginosa and acinetobacter baumani. 
while the Cupex 9003 from the Cupex developer, they uh, claim coverage in the non-fermenters. That includes carbapenem-resistant Pseudomonas aeruginosa and the carbapenem-resistant Acinetobacter baumeni, and it is in the phase one clean developmental stage. So, uh, what we were expecting uh, is from this uh, Spiro diagnostics and the QPEX is uh, to the five important uh, profiles where which will have an edge over the present day cholesterol or polymix and E. Those five includes one, the safety, especially renal injury. Second one is pharmacokinetic profile where to achieve a steady state serum concentration. And now all the cholesterol has got a very poor lung penetration, which is deemed unacceptable for lower respiratory infection and ventilated associated gram negative infections, either enterobacterials or due to non fermenters So here we need to look for the lung penetration in the newer polymix and modified polymix and novel polymixins. Then activity against cholesterol resistant organism, whether it will have an additional advantage of overcoming even the previous two drugs resistant mechanism and finally resistant selection profile so that this can be sustained or can be used for over a time of period so these are all the five uh, parameters which we are looking forward to see now uh, there are few other drugs which needs worth to mention are uh, in phase one stage especially for multidrug resistant gram negative focused iv antibiotics this include zero borbactam this is an beta lactamase inhibitor which works against class a class b class c and class d almost all the enzymes this knocks off this is developed by cupex pharma and it is a boronate based beta lactam inhibitor and interestingly, zero borbactam, they are trying to bring in both oral formulation as well as IV formulation. It looks they are partnering zero borbactam with the penum for the oral formulation, and uh, they are partnering with the miropenum for uh, as an uh, IV formulation. So, uh, unless uh, if this is revealed and the uh, in vitro data is shown, we are not sure. But this is at the preliminary stage, but it looks uh, very sensible to have these two partner combinations, which may be a good choice to have. Uh, another uh, promising novel drug from India, the bug work company 0977 is based on the novel topoisomerase inhibitor. So this has got a uh, wide uh, ranging activity against Carbapenem resistant enterobacterial Pseudomonas aeruginosa and Acinetobacter baumeni. Uh, however, uh, there is an, a limited in vitro in vivo data in the public domain. Uh, we are waiting for it. When it comes, we will know. But uh, it has been moved to currently in phase one development. Uh, more data is required to assess the coverage profile. We are hoping to have to see the data at the earliest. So now I move to the another uh, important requirement uh, or unmet need is the un, unmet met, <coughs> met need is multi drug resistant gram negative targeting oral antibiotics in clinical development. And uh, this oral uh, combinations includes ceftibutin AV Bactam from Pfizer, it's in the phase one development, ceftibutin Lidoborbactam. Uh, from uh, Ventorex, it's in phase one. Then Tebipenum and uh, Zerbobactam Cupex phase one. Uh, we are not sure. We have to wait and watch. And the Cefpodaxum Entasis 2 a 2 from Entasis, and it's in phase one. Uh, I'm not sure whether they are very active. It looks that it's a, they are a little lagging. So these are all the various promising oral combination because as of now, Amoxiclav is the only oral drug which is dominating or present in use for more than 45 to 50 years. So there is an urgent requirement for broad spectrum ESBL covering and the carbapenemase covering uh, oral, at least ESBL covering oral antibiotics. So now I'll move on to the oral antibiotics specific for ESBL UTI. 
recently uh, we have heard about this tebipenem. It is active against ESBL enterobacterials, but not active against carbapenemase producing org organisms. And interestingly, this is the new only drug which can be prescribed for uh, complicated urinary tract infection. Uh, however, uh, the phase three is completed and they have gone for the FDA approval. Uh, for unknown reasons, the FDA has not uh, approved it. They have asked for additional information. So even though it's promising and eventually they may get FDA approval, the larger question remain, uh, remain in our mind is use of oral carbapenem in community setting, which is a risk for selection of carbapenem resistant organism. So we have to wait and watch. Now I have moved on to the another oral drug for a urinary tract infection and uncomplicated gonorrhea that is Gipotidacin. It is an inhibitor of bacterial topoisomerase, something similar to Bugworks compound, not developed for carbapenem resistant infection. It's exclusively for ESBLs. So now I, uh, I would like to conclude uh, my talk. Uh, definitely India needs a novel at antibiotics. It's a very urgent priority to minimize the thousands of death which is occurring now. So definitely all of us, uh, obviously we know that the new drug is going to take long time uh, to come, the ideally what we desire to come to uh, be approved by FDA. Even if FDA approves, it takes on average to four to five years to reach India. So if the process of discovery and the FDA approval uh, and quickly the FDA approved drugs, if it comes to India, millions of death can be prevented. So both aspects are very important. One, the FDA approved drugs coming to India should be fast tracked, number one. And second, the Indian government should support clinical development for promising antibiotics for the simple reason, even if the FDA approved drugs to come to India, the affordability will be a big question. So if it is discovered in India and India has got a market, then, uh, sorry, patent, then it will be much cheaper and affordable for the Indian people and that will save again millions of life. And second uh, suggestion is more clarity on regulatory pathway in India is required. Then faster regulatory process is uh, another wish from the medical fraternity and the pharma companies. The promising and good things uh, happening at present is uh, the affordability uh, facilitated by the guard pull and push theory uh, where they are working on it if this can be expedited it will be well and good as of now they are taking some preliminary uh, in vitro and uh, clinical uh, trials once this works out and comes out uh, promising then probably we may have access to cefidorocol and cefipime tanibobactam uh, even though ideally as we wish uh, wished it was not there, but still it would be of great help uh, with the present day uh, alarming scenario of antimicrobial resistance. With this, I would like to end my talk. Thank you very much for giving this opportunity. Dr. Kafur. thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Balaji. It was really a comprehensive and enlightening talk. We're really convinced now how dangerous the resistance situation in gram negative, especially in India is and across the globe. And uh, this really emphasizes the need for new molecule. To chair this session, we have Dr. Ram Subramaniam also. Before inviting Dr. Ram Subramaniam, let me invite Dr. Gapoor to um, have his opinion on this topic. Thank you, Ashwini. Dr. Balaji has taken his red ink pen and put a red X everywhere on his slides. From the first slide, so the last slide, what I could see was red X everywhere. You have to really search hard to see Balaji's green green pen. Looks like he his green pen has run out of ink completely. You know, but you know he succeeded in convincing us the gravity of the gram-negative bacterial resistance scenario we are facing and the need for new antibiotic. We need new antibiotic, bought or stolen. 
no doubt about it thanks ashwini completely agree sir yeah there is no doubt we be bad be badly in need of new antibiotic so now we have dr ram subramanyam he is a senior consultant in infectious disease at apollo hospital chennai who will provide us with his valuable suggestions on how we would tackle amr challenge from a clinician's perspective good afternoon jim unil's report was a wake up call for the entire medical fraternity on the importance of antimicrobial resistance in causing death it has been portrayed as an evolving pandemic which is likely to lead to loss of millions of lives in the next couple of decades actually this is not true the crisis is already here it is the elephant in the room to solve this problem we have to understand the three fundamental principles regarding antimicrobial resistance the first is that antibiotics select out resistance which means the more we use antibiotics the greater the occurrence of resistance the second point is that antimicrobial resistance is inevitable and the third use of antibiotics in one person affects others unlike other classes of drugs when we use antibiotics on one individual it has repercussions on the entire community so what is the solution prudent use of antibiotics judicious use of antibiotics antimicrobial stewardship all that is fine but when for a country like india and other third world countries where there is a high level of resistance the options of using antibiotics is very limited the only answers are to come up with newer molecules we have to think of different ways to ensure that new molecules are introduced into the into the system out of box thinking especially related to combination of drugs and probably dosing has to be thought of but probably the way forward is precision medicine where we customize the drug to the specific infection in the patient it is time to realize that antimicrobial resistance is a not a problem only for the practicing clinician unless basic scientists epidemiologists policy makers and politicians join together to come up with an answer i think we are going to lose the battle conferences like these help great minds think and give more clarity to what needs to be planned to solve this problem thank you thank you sir for such a clear cut message and guidance for us now we'll move on to next session may i invite dr anup uh, to chair the next session anup moving on to a next session uh, next session is on treating untreatable when tb becomes totally resistant and uh, the talk will be de delivered by dr zari rudwadia he is the world renowned tb expert he is a consultant pulmonologist at hinduja hospital mumbai so dr zari rudwadia please Uh, congratulations to Professor Gafoor for setting up this remarkable conference on uh, a theme which is of overriding importance for all of us. Uh, I'm a TB expert and uh, I've lost count of the number of patients with completely drug resistant TB that we have encountered. So it fits well into the theme of this conference. Now, if I can just sec, advance my slides, there we are. So TB remains the world's foremost infectious disease. One billion people have died of this disease over the last two centuries, and that's a staggering statistic. TB control has been sabotaged by the emergence, first of drug-resistant TB, and more recently of COVID as well, by COVID as well, rather. Uh, and the global burden of drug-resistant TB is estimated at at least half a million cases. Uh, and this figure has not changed over the last uh, five years. In fact, cases have doubled uh, in the last five years. Only one in three cases of drug-resistant TB in 2018 even received treatment. The rest, the rest were just lost 
uh, and flow under the radar. When they are treated, the success rates for this disease are dismal. In fact, for XDR, they used to approximate success rates of the pre-chemotherapy era, which is about 40 or 50% of patients only being successfully cured. This is from a book called The Forgotten Plague. And uh, Frank Ryan, the author, says it seems almost incredible that during the last two centuries, a single disease, TB, was responsible, as I said, for the deaths of approximately a thousand million human beings. That's one billion people. And TB remains, uh, without doubt, the biggest killer. No disease has caused more damage to the human species through history than this disease has. The number of deaths from tuberculosis outstrips those from smallpox and malaria, plague, influenza, cholera, and AIDS, all put together. Now, we have details from the Global TB report of just a year ago, and uh, it shows that about 10 million people will develop TB annually, about uh, 1.8 million, and about a quarter of a million will die of drug. Heads the list here. Uh, we have the most new TB cases in the world. We have the most MDR TB cases in the world. We have the most deaths from tuberculosis of all forms globally. TB still kills one Indian every minute. That's 15,000 people die every day because of tuberculosis. And of course, this takes a staggering toll in terms of economic loss, as you can see here. So if you were a evil dictator hell-bent on creating an MDR-TB epidemic in a country, what would you do? You would do what we have done, sadly, over the last few decades in our country, which is to create a social and economic climate that promotes poverty and promotes inequity, because sadly, TB remains a disease of the poor. You would subject infectious TB patients to squalid, overcrowded living conditions, and just think of the sad overcrowding which exists in many of our slums and ghettos, in the big cities at least, you'd provide inadequate treatment, which is really a guarantor of drug resistance. No disease is as unfailing, unforgiving of any slips in the drugs, doses, timing of therapy as TB is. And then if you add HIV into this mix, as we did about 30 years ago, which increases the risk of progression from infection to active disease, you really have created a pandemic. And how did we get to this sorry state? Delays in diagnosis, inappropriate treatment in the private sector and the public sector, the cost, the complexity and the difficulty of treating this disease. This is a disease which should be handled by specialists, yet in this country is sadly still looked after by every average general practitioner who will take on such a case, uh, make things a lot worse, and then at the last minute, throw his hands up and refer him appropriately. And then don't underestimate the impact of other non-communicable diseases on tuberculosis. And then the intangibles, what are the macro level features, like, for example, public health issues. And this is a big failing in our country, sadly, as well. So let's look briefly at each of these. Errors in diagnosis add up all the time. We don't ask for DSTs. We don't ask for gene experts, a very standardized, quite readily available 24-hour test, which will give you almost like a point of care test, an immediate answer if A, someone is infected by TB, and B, if that strain is sensitive or drug resistant. Then, of course, you do need to confirm that with DST testings, but there's a great variation and they're often unreliable in smaller labs. And then, of course, sadly, instead of pursuing the two main tests we need to, we ask for inappropriate, expensive tests, which add little CT scans, IGRAs, TB serology, all of which are no substitute for a DST. There are real shortages of gene expert machines and quality control labs across the country. This is the last time from which we have this data when you can see how woefully under-equipped this country was with just 0.2 labs per million population. Those figures have changed slightly, as I'll show you from a more recent slide. But remember that bad diagnostics can, can kill a patient just as bad treatment does. This is a very recent slide which shows 
that India has heavily invested in the experts since then. And from 2016 onwards, the RNTCP has procured more machines, and we can see that the progress has been made in the number of labs and the means by which we diagnose drug resistance in this country. But there are still considerable delays in commencing treatment in TB patients, at least in Mumbai, when for drug sensitive patients, the delay was 69 days. And for MDR patients, the delay was 192 days. What do I mean? This is the point, the start of the blue bar at which the patient has his first symptom and approaches a first healthcare provider. And it's a gap of 192 days after which, at the end of the green bar, we will even commence appropriate treatment. All these are delays in diagnosis, delays in commencing appropriate treatment, and that average delay works out to 192 days. In this time, of course, the patient is transmitting a sometimes deadly form of tuberculosis to his very crowded household contacts around him. And you know the kind of overcrowding existing in the average Indian house or slum. The public sector is to be blamed. It is underfunded as a program. When TB is our main public health priority, uh, it should deserve and demand much more in terms of funds. For decades, the program did not even accept the existence of MDR-TB. It was swept under the carpet. So focused were we on drug-sensitive TB that we clearly failed patients who were not responding. They were not diagnosed MDR. They were not treated, therefore, as MDR. Till their numbers grew exponentially, the clamor grew too loud to ignore. And now, sadly, primary MDR-TB is the commonest form of drug resistance that we encounter. The private sector of which I am a part is equally to blame. And I have to turn the mirror on my colleagues and say that this is a huge, unengaged, unregulated, and sadly, exploitative sometimes private sector. Many, many hospitals, the great majority in this country are privately run. 76% of doctors across the country engage in private practice. 50% of doctors are of alternative faiths. Faiths like homeopathy, Ayurveda, Yunani, which at least I, as an allopath, have no faith in at all. And poor knowledge, poor training, dismal prescribing practice, even of our allopaths, for a disease that is India's most common health problem, continues to prevail. This is Dharavi, where we've done lots of our research. I'll give you a few seconds just to stare at the magnitude of the overcrowding here a staggering population density of 1 million per square mile, which is probably the most you can get anywhere on the globe. <clears throat> and in this article we published uh, in PLOS One many years ago, uh, we showed how bad prescriptions were fueling MDR-TB because we asked a group of Dharavid doctors what treatment they would give a 50 kilo patient with MDR-TB, a hypothetical patient, and only five of the 106 prescriptions were deemed appropriate prescriptions by us. Only five of 106. The majority of the prescriptions these Dharavi practicing doctors turned in would have served only to amplify resistance, to convert MDR to XDR and beyond. Even within the private sector, TB patients often seek care from lots of informal providers. And don't blame your TB patients for desperately seeking out whatever they think can give them benefit. So this is the almost uh, uh, maze of patients and uh, patient providers that patients are seeing in the qualified sector, in the informal sector, chemists, nurses, GPs of all persuasions. And these are parts of desperation in these lines that you can see here. Uh, and sadly, they still are cured about 30 to 40% of times. So what are the problems with the current MDR treatment? It's far too long. You ID specialists on this, on this panel and in this symposium know that 24 months of treatment must be the most for any infectious disease. And these are drugs which are not to be scoffed at. They have debilitating side effects. In fact, 60% major adverse effects were reported in a South African cohort of MDR-TB patients. They're far too expensive. 
I can treat 5,000 drug sensitive patients for what it costs me to treat a single MDR TB patient. And sadly, these are ineffective bacteriostatic drugs. In fact, they've been rejected for drug sensitive TB, and we adopt them almost by default because we have or had no new drugs to offer these patients. And I will be talking about new drugs in the last few slides that I have. So cure rates are a dismal, I would say 30 to 40% for XDR and 50 to 60% for MDR. And as a result, there are high default rates. Don't blame a patient for being a defaulter. He defaults because he's helpless. He's helpless because of adverse effects, because of, because of doctors who treat him without any sympathy or empathy. And because he is uh, just not getting cured despite months and months of treatment. Uh, a patient with MDRTB must take one, four, six, zero, zero pills over two years, and you stack up those pills, and it would be as tall as the tallest high rise in Bombay. So it's not an easy task being an MDRTB patient and being compliant with this range of drugs with the toxicity they have. And we looked at the costing as well. Uh, the comprehensive cost, at least abroad, is a staggering $300,000 to cure one patient with MDRTB in New Zealand. But India is not New Zealand. And the mean cost in the Indian private sector is at the very least $5,600. This averages 235% of our patients' incomes and it amounts to what the WHO calls a catastrophic cost. Non-communicable diseases are also driving the TB epidemic, as I said. There is a strong link between tuberculosis and our patients' poor nutritional status, and you know how malnourishment thrives in this country, as does poverty. Diabetes is a risk factor for tuberculosis. Diabetics are at least three, four, three to four-fold more likely to get TB and possibly to get MDR-TB. There's a link between smoking and tuberculosis, and we are the smoking capital of the world as well. And of course, there's a link between biomass cooking exposure, and again, India heads this poll, and the prevalence of TB across the globe. So we have created this alphabet soup of drug resistance, from MDR-TB discovered in 1992, to pre-XDR-TB in 1995, to XDR-TB in 2006, to what we call totally drug-resistant TB in 2011. And MDR remains an iatrogenic disease. It's arising under the pressure of inadequate therapy. Let's talk a little about TDR-TB because I was directly uh, responsible for this name, uh, much, to the, much to the anger of some of my colleagues. Uh, it's no surprise at least to me, when TDRTB emerged from this country, and we reported it in a, a, a premier journal in 2011, we defined it as resistance to all 12 of the first and second line drugs that were then, at that time, currently available. I think it's fair to say that it served a purpose. It did shake up TB control in India. It brought drug-resistant TB out of the closet, bringing attention to this virtually untreatable strain and it focused intense medical and public attention on drug-resistant TB in India. The WHO had a special meeting to discuss if such uh, a name was appropriate, and a group of experts said that uh, it had negative connotations because uh, no one could be really totally drug-resistant. New drugs might emerge, which we did not disagree with. All we said was that with available drugs and testing at the time we reported this in 2011, our patients were resistant to all drugs, so totally drug resistant at the time. Let me describe one of the four patients that we wrote up, and this is a prototype of the patient I sadly still see to this day in my clinics, my TB clinics at the Hindu Church. She was a female who was a resident of Dharavi. She'd had TB for five years. She'd consulted multiple physicians for treatment of her TB and received multiple first and second line drugs. What could be more soul destroying than having taken more than 60 months, more than five years of treatment across the public and private sectors in two states in completely different parts of the country, having received every available drug, 
often in the incorrect dose and with considerable attendant toxicity. Multiple doctors, innumerable drugs, never ever a DST, sadly, yes, in five years of treatment. So I, I think, Abdul, this highlights so many of the problems uh, that you see in other conditions as well, but none as starkly as this. And by the time we saw her, you can see that one lung was ravaged by TB. But even this, in the scale of things we see, is a good X-ray because you can see the other lung seemed to be relatively spared, except for a few nodules. This was her resistance pattern. And if you don't call this totally drug resistant, I don't know what you do. She was resistant to every drug we could test at least. So in the absence of all available second line drugs, a salvage regime was put together, <coughs> followed by aggressive surgery. She never turned uh, DST negative, culture negative, but we said we will give her a few months of salvage drugs. We put together some kind of salvage regime. We had to give up at the Hinduja hospital where I work. And we said her only hope, if drugs are not going to work, is a left-sided pneumonectomy. We got that decision wrong, sadly, because while she was stable on the first day and we were delighted, by day two, she went into a spiral of fever, hypertension, sepsis, and respiratory failure and died on day four of refractory respiratory failure with an x-ray which sadly looked like this. The left lung had been removed. This was either spillover of TB or uh, hospital-acquired pneumonia in the other good lung. Uh, that was just some of the news coverage which accompanied our totally drug-resistant TB at the time. I think it served its purpose in terms of attracting attention to this disease. Uh, this included a time cover with one of our patients on it. And uh, I began to wonder at one stage, uh, Abdul, if TDR stood for triggering dramatic responses. But uh, I think we leave the nomenclature uh, on the side for now. So how do you treat these untreatable patients who have exhausted all drug options, where sometimes surgery is not an option? Should I continue to treat to reduce the infectiousness, accepting that I will never cure these patients? Is there a protocol to withdraw all drugs as there is in terminal cancer? And isn't it sad that in this day and age, there are articles in the Lancet respiration on palliative care in drug-resistant TB when you exhaust all options? What emotional support do I give patients like this in crowded, busy OPDs when I have less than a few minutes to devote to each patient? What about the rights of communities, individuals, my junior colleagues, so many of whom have been infected by similar strains, and who demand protection from such patients? And are there facilities where we can incarcerate perhaps these patients to prevent community spread? And would that be appropriate and ethical? These are all questions to which sadly I don't have an answer. It's the kind of patient who's brought to me across the monsoon a few years ago with drug resistant TB. And we had to turn him back because we'd almost gone at that time to the sanatorium days. And these are patients lined up in the early days of sanatoriums in the UK. And this patient was sent back because he had a resistance profile looking like this and a CT which looked like this. In the last couple of minutes of my talk, that change has occurred and change is in the air. And I just hope that this continues because we've had a global TB drug pipeline for a while, but it has finally spat out three exciting, powerful bacteriostatic antituberculosis drugs after 50 years of neglect. Bedaquilin, Delaminid, and Pritominid. And this is my patient, the first Indian patient to receive Bedaquilin. I know the ordeal it was getting it, for, getting it for him. At that time, many, many years ago, we had to appeal to the company making it, Janssen, to supply it on compassionate grounds. Uh, this is him holding on to the precious consignment when it occurred by post after spending a month in customs. Uh, and he was given it free of charge. And I'd be happy to say and let you know that this man, a tailor living in Dharavi, is cured and well 10 years later almost and comes and sees me still. He was the first Indian patient to receive the drug before the program had started even distributing it. And I'm also happy to give credit where it's due. The program has adopted this drug in a big way. 
And now almost every MDRTB patient I see, even referred from a smaller state, is receiving Bedaquiline. So that is delightful news. But a new drug is still too late. We need new regimes because adding a new drug to existing regimes which are not working is, as you know, uh, against all principles of good infectious disease care and is doomed to failure. So we need new regimes. We need them now. And with the approval of bedaquiline, of delaminid, of pretominid, the recognition of the great anti-TB effects and potency of linezolid and the results of three or four large RCTs, which I won't have the time or place to discuss now, the Xenex trial, the TB practical, South African NTP data, all published and available for you to look up, the WHO finally endorsed, and I'm part of this group, finally endorsed three different all oral six to nine month shorter regimes. So it is a huge success, a huge victory for our patients because we now have to offer them BPAL, BPAL with Moxie and the older regime, the South African regime, which goes on for nine months. But yes, it is possible to now talk of curing MDR or XDR within six months of treatment, provided you are still sensitive, of course, to bedaquilin, pretominate and linezolid. Of course, our deadly bacterial enemy is always one step ahead of us. And I can tell you that my current bedaquiline resistance rates run at about 5%. And my current linezolid rates, and we've just published on this, run at about 7%. So the specter of drug resistance, sadly, is always casting its shadow on us. This is Madhu Pai, a friend and colleague, and again, a vocal advocate of the newer regimes. And here he has the BPAL regime total, the total regime in one hand, compared to all the drugs filed into these plastic canisters with the standard regime. So you tell me as doctors here, which would you prefer to take if you had XTRTB, this or this? No wonder he's smiling in this picture. I mean, it's a no brainer, but yet patients were subjected for decades to this kind of inefficient toxic treatment. So to conclude, ladies and gentlemen, after decades of neglect, we have witnessed explosive growth in the field. Newer drugs have been added to repurpose drugs to make up new all oral shorter regimes and several are available and there are 10 more I've not had time to go to in the pipeline. Results awaited any day. In fact, in November at the Union TB conference, uh, we will have some initial data on another regime. So. Three new drugs, don't forget their names, bedaquilin, pretominid, and delaminid, plus three repurposed drugs. Sorry, two repurposed drugs that should read, linezolid and moxifloxacin. Delaminid is a new drug. So two repurposed drugs, linezolid and moxifloxacin. Sadly, our moxiflox resistance rates are, for TB are about 60%, and that's no surprise because you know the way fluoroquinolones are thrown around like water for every possible infection. And this in combination has resulted in newer, all oral, shorter regimes, example, BPAL. But my wish list goes on. I wish for political will. I wish that we can build fences between the private and the public sector. Uh, sorry, build bridges, not fences. I beg your pardon. Fences are what exist already. Uh, I wish we have a program that could offer free quality MDR-TB care to all, and our government program is slowly moving in the right direction. I wish we could legislate that only certified doctors could treat MDR-TB, those with some experience in the field, those with some interest in the field. We need to prioritize health over nuclear warheads in our budgets. We need to focus on the biosocial, along with the medical, we need to bridge, bridge the huge funding gap. We could turn around the COVID pandemic in about two years. We have 15 COVID vaccines available. Why can't we do the same for tuberculosis? The answer lies in the funds that were apportioned to different diseases. 
And the reason is because COVID was a disease which affected the West, while TB sadly remains one of the developing world. And of course, top on my list, really not at the bottom, would be a new vaccine, because we are still laboring with the BCG vaccine, which is over a century old and very, very weak. So I like this quote from Thomas Dormandy, who said, TB is the perfect expression of an imperfect civilization. And I'm going to end with another picture of one of my very ill XDRTB patients and a quote from my personal hero, Paul Farmer, who said, our mission must be to treat the sick, not just the sick who can pay, to treat TB regardless of resistance pattern. I'm going to stop sharing my screen there. Thank you for your time and uh, thank Abdul again for inviting me to talk at this conference. Thank you, Dr. Zarif. That was really an enlightening talk. We all respect your remarkable contribution to the field of tuberculosis and you have really convinced us on the dangerous situation. We don't concentrate our efforts to bring out new TB drugs. However, well, it's really heartening to know that Indian government is providing bedaquiline free of cost in, as a part of TB program to all the patients uh, free of cost. To chair this session, we have Dr. Nato. He is a consultant physician and infectious disease specialist at Kottayam Medical College, Kerala. Dr. Nato, what's your opinion on the urgent need to invest in new TB drugs? Yeah. Thank you for giving me this opportunity uh, and uh, congrats to Dr. Abdul Gaffur and team for bringing up this. So regarding newer TB drugs, as I had mentioned in his talk, uh, in the past 50 years, only three new drugs, bedaquiline, pritoman and linozole and uh, delamanid has come. And uh, he has mentioned towards the end of his talk that 5% uh, bedaquiline resistance and around 7% linozole resistance is already encountered. So considering this, I strongly feel that there is a huge need of increasing our, expanding our armamentarium against tuberculosis, unless otherwise we might be going to the Armageddon, to the final battle against tuberculosis. And just one more point, uh, all these studies that have been more conducted in pulmonary tuberculosis, if we consider extra pulmonary tuberculosis, maybe something like TB meningitis, these drugs, which the, even the newer drugs might not be as helpful as the, uh, as the previous drugs. So regarding drug penetration, we need drugs with more penetration into the CNS. We need drugs with lesser side effect. We need drugs that could be used for a long duration if required, not something like linozolid. That would be having increased side effects if used for something like 26 weeks. So uh, there is a strong need for newer drugs and that is my comment on this aspect. Thank you. We are blessed to have Dr. Camilla with us who has vast, huge experience in TB and who is a part of so many WHO trials. Camilla, ma'am, what's your um, word of wisdom for us? I think clearly um, Sari's talk is, is depressing, but yet heartening in a way because I think our country has really ramped up in terms of the integrated DRTB algorithm. Today, every patient who is a suspect will get a CBNAT that is either expert or a QNAT. And better still, that is reconfirmed at a referral lab by doing an LPA. With LPA, even for rifampicin susceptible patients on the, on the CBNAT, we get an INA susceptibility, and that's huge. And MDR patients are also subject to an LPA second line, which gives us an idea of chloroquinolone resistance. So we are really in a better place than we were earlier. So I'm kind of hopeful that diagnostic-wise, really country has ramped up a lot. We get, I mean, in my lab, I get 250 cultures a day. So it's, it's, it's a lot, but it's because I think diagnostics have been, a lot of priority has been placed. And Today, I mean, on, at the union conference, just to add a bit, they're talking about next year being the tongue of the swab because they actually have developed technologies at point of care by taking swabs from the dorsum of the tongue by looking at SAD, uh, at CAD, that is com uh, com uh, computer, computer uh, diagnostics in terms of X-rays AI, and by looking at urinary second and third generation tests for TB that are much better than the old LA ones. LA was okay for HIV patients who had low CD4 counts, but now with QG lamb, they're looking at better tests at point of care. And finally, one point that spoke about provided we had the, the correct treatment. 
we have just completed a study on DRTB looking at targeted next gen sequencing. And this is amazing. We're looking at getting from embedded treatment to precision treatment because we're getting the, all the mutations for all these drugs, Vidacrylin, linezolid, clofazamine, ethionamide, uh, ethambutol, pyrazinamide, drugs that we had to wait for the DSTs. So I think once WHO endorses targeted next gen sequencing and it becomes plug and play for our country, it should be really, really absolutely revolutionary. So I'm optimistic from the diagnostic perspective. I think things have really, really gone up. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. So let's move on to next session. Um, I'll hand over it to Dr. Nitin Bansal, who is also one of our trustees. Over to you, Nitin. Thank you, ma'am, and uh, good evening, everyone. I hope everybody is enjoying these talks from various experts. And we have we have so far heard from about various issues among resistance in bacteria and mycobacteria. So now we are going to hear about current trends in antifungal resistance and needs need for innovation in this field. To chair the session, we have Dr. Vikas Suri, who is a professor of medicine in PGM at Chandigarh, and the speaker will be none other than uh, Dr. Arunalok Chakravarti, who is the past president of Ishan. Now we will listen to his talk. Hello, I'm Unalok Chakravarti. I'm going to discuss a very important topic, current status of resistance in the fungal world and the need of new molecule. It is said that there is emergence of antifungal resistance worldwide, and that is causing challenge in human health and food security. As well as one of the most important compound used as antifungal, it is not only used in human and animal health, this is also used in crop protection. And because of use of fungicide, there is development of resistance which is coming up in case of specially aspergillus fumigators. So whenever we have to discuss antifungal resistance, now we have to bring this issue of one health. In case of WHO, very recently they released the priority fungal pathogen and amongst this priority fungal pathogen, they said this prioritization has been made on the basis of antifungal resistance as taking into top priority. And in the critical group, we have Cryptococcus, Candida auris, Aspergillus fumigatus, and Candida albicans. Now, amongst the antifungal, we have four classes of antifungal, Azoles, Echinocandin, Pollins, and Flucytosine. Main problem is, host is eukaryotic, fungus is eukaryotic. So there is little scope of exploiting the metabolism. That's why we have very few classes of antifungal. And if one class developing resistance, then there is problem in case of antifungal management. So earlier we used to say that amputation B is the gold standard of antifungal therapy. But now we are seeing several species are coming up, which are either intrinsically resistant or acquired resistance against amputation B. There are several other factors like PKPD issue is coming up in case of treatment management. So when I have to discuss the treatment failure, it is not synonymous to antifungal resistance. In case of treatment failure, we have this host factor, fungus factor, and of course the drug factor which is there. In the host, the immunological status is very important because we are using fungistatic drug we need good immunity. Site of the disease is very important where antifungal can reach or not. In case of fungus, if the virulence is very high, then there is problem and of course the drug resistance is important factor. And in case of the antifungal drug, PKPD issue is very important. So I'm going to discuss this drug resistance and this drug resistance earlier we used to know against fluconazole, but now resistance is emerging in case of the echinocandine. And this drug resistance can be intrinsic, acquired, or clinical drug resistance. Intrinsic resistance has been seen in case of uh, yeast like Candida cruzei against fluconazole or glabrata, which can be against fluconazole, Candida parapsilosis against caspofungin, in case of mold, pseudoelistia boidae, fusarium, pislomyces, which are resistance to amputation B. Whatever you may say about development of resistance in fungi, it is just not like bacteria. 
we are fortunate that this is not a first track event like bacteria there is no vitreal lactamase there is no horizontal transfer there is no plasmid transposome or esbl and there is a gradual resistance which is emerging and that all because of point mutation or because of efflux pump whether you see in as well polyene echinocandine or fibrocytosin mutation is the most important factor along with the flux pump so it all depends on how much uh, you make a selective pressure by using prophylactic and empiric so that the mutation comes up and of course what is the mutation rate in the fungi that is also important factor other factors like how it is dispersing in the uh, community and what is the population growth and urbanization these are becoming important but this paradigm suddenly changed with the three facts with the emergence of multi drug resistance candida oris with the azol resistance aspergillus fumigatus and tarvinafin resistance dermatophyte in asian country other issues are emergence of drug resistant species in candida intrinsic drug resistant or in case of aspergillus emergence of the echinocandine resistance candida glabrata and in case of the species where we used to say you can safely use fluconazole that is coming up resistant like in case of albicans and tropicalis first coming to candida oris you know this is one fungus which is just behaving like bacteria it is easily transmitted cause severe infection high mortality it contaminates the environment first it is not easily identified it is resilient against disinfectant it is developing resistant very fast and you can see it started in 2008 from japan and south korea and within decade it spread to 43 countries so first time in case of fungi new york times had to put on their front page that the fungus immune to the drugs quietly sweeps the globe and center for disease control of atlanta has put candida oris under urgent threat urgent threat category along with carbapenem resistance acinetobacter or enterobacteria by whole genome sequencing it had seen that candida oris has got four clades clade one clade two clade three clade four and these clades are quite different genetically clade one which is seen in case of south asia has shown very high drug resistance almost 100 percent resistance to fluconazole Voriconazole 50 percent, amphotericin B 30 percent, whereas the East Asian clades is low drug resistant. Clade 3, which is common in South Africa, it is high drug resistant to fluconazole and voriconazole, but not to amphotericin B. And clade 4, which is common in South America, it has got variable result in different countries. Now, another important fact which I am bringing out in case of Candida oris. You know, this study we have conducted a decade back in 27 ICU in India. We have shown that in bloodstream isolate, 1400 cases, Candida Waris was 5.2%. But very recent study in different centers in India, which had shown that Candida Waris amongst the bloodstream infection is the first rank in order. And if I have to ask this question, how COVID-19 affected Candida Waris? There are very few studies. Meta-analysis of 10 to 11 studies had shown that there is variable incidence from 2.8 to 30 percent candy oris among these candemia cases. But overall pool prevalence had shown up to 5.7 to 14 percent. And the mortality in the group of candy oris with candemia is very high, nearly 70 percent. In India, two ICU combined data which had shown that candemia rate had gone up twofold during this COVID-19. And here, candia oris is 42%. Candia tropical is 21 and candia oris is 42. Just opposite. That means double the number of candia tropicalis, which was the earlier isolates. Now, after candia oris, let's see how other species are performing in case of drug resistance. We know there is a shift in case of these species. No more candida albicans is the predominant species. It is non-albicans candida, which is more important. And non-albicans candida, especially glabrata, cusei, which are drug resistance, is emerging. You see, candida glabrata is poorly responsive to fluconazole. But at the same time, it causes urinary tract infection. 
And urinary tract infection, if you cannot give fluconazole, what drug you can give? Echinocandine don't cross the urinary barrier, so it do not, does not go well into the urinary tract infection. Moreover, in Candia glabrata, resistance has been shown, especially in case of America and Europe, it has gone more than 20%. In case of echinocandine, especially when we are treating abdominal candidiasis, we should remember that it does not penetrate the peritoneum well. And that's why there is a chance of developing resistance to echinocandine because of less passage and developing low concentration in the peritoneum and developing resistance. So if we see the species distribution amongst the defined candida, yes, candida albicans has gone below 50%, but only in North Europe, it had shown even more than 50%. But this blue picture is showing about the Candia glabrata, which is quite common in North Europe and North America. In case of South America, we see Candida parapsilosis. Even in Southern Europe, we are seeing Candida parapsilosis. In case of Asia, six countries data shows that there is Candia glabrata is around 14%. And this is the data of which I have just shown in case of uh, 27 ICU in India, where it has shown that the Candia tropicalis is the predominant species, but Candia glabrata and Cusia is around 5 to 6 percent. But even in this albicans and tropicalis, we are seeing the resistance is coming up. You see this 27 ICU data had shown that in case of resistant and susceptible dose dependent, if we club together, it had gone up to 45 percent means only 55% of this albicans and tropical is which are susceptible to fluconazole. In other countries like Malaysia, China, we see the same picture of resistance which is emerging against albicans, tropicalis, and even parapsilosis. WHO has compiled this data which showed that in case of albicans and tropicalis, especially in certain countries like South Africa, India, and Denmark, where the resistance is closing to nearly 50% which have been there. Very recent data in China showed that there is a decline in azole susceptibility rate in Candia tropicalis, and you can see 22% resistance or 78% susceptible in Candia tropicalis. Even resistance is emerging in glabrata and parapsilosis. Parapsilosis is very important species in case of South America. And here, there's a meta-analysis of 79 studies from 20 countries, which showed that in case of parapsilosis, fluconazole resistance is 15.2%. And you can see the resistance before 2016, it was only 11.6% and 36.7% after 2016. And this had been seen very high in South Africa, where the resistance has shown even crossing 50%. We have seen now many rare species of yeast coming up, even in bloodstream infection. And these yeast are multi-drug resistant. So here it is not the fluconazole or echinocandine can be used, rather liposomal amphotericin B need to be used. India is conducting a national anti-microbial resistance surveillance and antifungal resistance surveillance is one of the part of it. And it shows that in case of candida auris, of course, there is higher resistance. But disturbing fact is that even in echinocandine, the susceptibility has come down so low, that means nearly or more than 30% strains are resistant in case of echinocandine. That is very disturbing fact. And we are also seeing resistance in case of glabrata, parapsilosis, cruzii against fluconazole, even against the voriconazole, which is being there. So if you see in case of this fluconazole, the resistance in cruzii is low, Glabrata is coming down, of course, parapsilosis is going down, and oris, of course, there is no susceptible stain against fluconazole. But here, if you see, in case of this voriconazole, in oris is going up. Echinocandine resistance is going up in Candia cruzii, even in case of Candia glabrata. So these are all disturbing facts. Now, coming to the mold area. Mold area, especially aspergillus, where the maximum discussion is there, especially with azole resistance. And here the resistance can develop by two ways. One, for a long-term use, which have been seen in case of UK or United Kingdom, where because of use in 
chronic pulmonary aspergillosis or allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis using this anti-fungal azole for a long time, there is development of resistance. But whereas in case of the Netherlands, in case of the Germany, it had shown because of the fungicide use, there is development of resistance. And this resistance is more than 20% in those countries. Whereas in all European countries, it is quite variable, point, point, variable from 0.6 to 30%. In rest of the world, the resistance is not very high, like India 1.7, Iran 3.5, Australia 2.6, but we need to be cautious against this as well resistance development in Aspergillus fumigators or Aspergillus flavors. Now, in case of classical risk group for fungal infection, like, the, like in hematologic malignancy and transplant patient, the selection pressure with the profile axis is changing. Selection pressure of this causing change in species of the fungi causing infection, and there is breakthrough infection coming up. After fluconazole, when mold active prophylaxis has been given, there is triazole resistance as pargillus is coming up. You can see this is very good study uh, where breakthrough infection versus non-breakthrough had been compared, and it has shown that in aspergillus the drug resistance ustas is coming up. So there is change due to expanding use of aspergillus active antifungal in prophylaxis, empiric, and targeted therapy. We are seeing cryptic species is coming up. And these cryptic species are resistant not only to amputation B, even to the echinocandine, which is coming up. That's very important. And of course, as well resistance. Now, cryptic species of aspergillus has gone up 10%. And it has got high mortality, 40%. And they have got high MIC to as well and amputation B. Very recent data published from UK National Mycology Reference Laboratory. This is very important data regarding aspergillus fumigators. You can see this data compared 2006 to 16 with 2019 to 20. In case of voriconazole, the resistance has gone up from 2.7 to 26%. In case of itraconazole, from 5% gone up to 20%. In case of posaconazole, from 8%, it has gone to 37%. And even the new drug, isabuconazole, the resistance is nearly 30%. Somehow, in this particular study, they found that amputation B, there is no resistance. But if you see other data, it has shown that it all depends on the species, like Tedious, Flavors, Niger, where there is more resistance against amputation B. So aspergillus flavors is a very important factor in case of some of the Asian country, even in case of the African country, like in case of Sudan. It has shown that in one of our study, in case of the ICU, that it is equal in frequency to the aspergillus fumigators. And aspergillus flavors is very important because here, even in case of this amputation B and in case of azole, it has got more resistance compared to aspergillus fumigators. So if you look into, again, this national data, which have been uh, in India, which is from India, it had showed that Aspergillus flavors amputation B susceptibility has gone down below 50%. That means more than 50% are resistant. Caspofungi resistance is also emerging. Whether it is the patients are isolated from OPD, ward, ICU, the same picture. Aspergillus fumigators, even there is also resistance which is coming up against amputation B and against the caspofungi which have been there. This is very disturbing because in dermatophytosis, we know there is good drug now available and it could take care. But this particular editorial when published, it really created a lot of hue and cue because great Indian epidemic of superficial dermatophytosis. Here, there is 30% tabinafin resistance which have been developed in case of dermatophytes. To a great extent, it has come up because of this type of drug use. It is having steroid, bacteria, and fungus together, and we see this bizarre clinical presentation. And when we studied, we found even in tabinafin, the MIC value is more than eight, which have been there. Cryptococcus neoformis, which have been put into the priority pathogen by WHO, where there are only two drugs which are commonly being used, amputation B and fluconazole. In fluconazole, this is a big 
number of fires had been studied, it showed that the mean prevalence of resistance has gone to 12%. And especially in case of the relapse isolates, it has gone nearly 25%. This is quite disturbing. So what is the reason for this antifungal resistance? I would say one of the important factors is the improper use of antifungal. Antibiotic use also causing disturbance in the balance in the host microbial diversity, leading to the tolerance in less susceptible fungi. Fungicide use, already I've said about azole well resistance in Asperger's fumigators in Europe. Natural resistance can also come up, spontaneous resistance, acquired resistance, but why so high resistance in Candida oris, we still don't know. Now, this is very important when we see so much inappropriate therapy. Like in case of Spain, it had shown up to 57%. In case of France, 65% patient receiving antifungal without proven invasive fungal infection. Even another study from France shows 79% had non-documented fungal infection because clinicians, whether they are diagnosing or not diagnosing, they like to give antifungal at the end before going to the sleep. Even in India, very recently we have published this data from our institute where inappropriate antifungal use had been shown up to 25%. But friends, if we look into this particular meta-analysis where we looked into the diagnostic stewardship, we found that diagnostic stewardship helps to bring down the mortality, bring down the length of stay, bring down the cost of treating these patients in case of hospital. I would say this particular fact is also to be taken into consideration. How much we rely on antifungal susceptibility testing? Of course, we have the breakpoint in case of the common candida species, common aspergilla species. CLSI and UCAS has developed some of these guidelines. But here, generally, they recommend to use one colony because it is believed that in blood isolates, it is the one colony of one strain which produced this infection. But very recent data from uh, these European countries has shown that 5.6% of the blood culture isolate harbor poly resistance. So uh, possibly we have to modify the antifungal susceptibility testing method. So when WHO has released this priority pathogen, they mentioned that there is intervention required for evidence-based action to prevent and control infection and the emergence of antifungal resistance. Friends, as we have only four antifungal, we need new antifungal so that we can handle such antifungal resistance which is coming up. Two new antifungal now being used, one is isabuconazole, another is the Ivex fungrip. Isabuconazole is used in aspergillus and mucormycosis. It has been found that utility in treating horiconazole resistance candida, which needs to be further confirmed. In IVEX fungrip, most important thing is that there is no cross resistance among currently available antifungal. It is a promising new agent against invasive candidiasis, even as all resistance candida species. There are a few more antifungals which are in the pipeline. One of them is echinocandine, that is the rezafuzin. Rezafuzin can be given once in a week. So it has got a good bioavailability, but it is somehow not useful in echinocandine resistant candida species, but as well resistant candida aspergillus, it can be used. Ivex fungrip already have you said. Another is the manojepix. Manojepix, you can see both in echinocandine resistant and as well resistant, it can be used. Even certain species where there is no drug almost available, like Fusarium, and in case of Sclerosporium, it might be useful. Somehow, still, we don't have a good drug in mucorels. Possibly, Manojepix can only be used with marginal activity. So, friends, we need new antifungal to overcome this resistance which is coming up. Emergence of antifungal, emergence of multidrug resistance candida oris is a big challenge. Even it is developing resistance to candy. Acquired resistance to candida is emerging not only in case of the uh, candida glabrata and cruzii, even in case of albicans and tropicalis. Aspergillus fumigators, triazole resistance is a major issue in Europe. 
Intrinsic drug resistance species are coming up in case of Candida and cryptic species in case of Aspergillus. Tavinafil resistance to Dermatophyte is a major concern in case of India. Flucomazole resistance in Cryptococcus is another concern. I would say inappropriate antifungal therapy is a very important fact which need to be reduced. So there is no scope of complacency. The amount of resistance has complicated now the antifungal management. We need to improve the diagnosis. We need novel antifungal drug predicting resistance and antifungal stewardship. We need routine antifungal susceptibility testing and development of new antifungal. Already bacteriologists are drowned in the water because of such development of high resistance coming up in bacteria. If we have playing like this as mycologists, we will be same picture which can be seen in case of bacteriologists. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, sir, for such an enlightening lecture. Uh, to discuss the topic further, uh, I would like to ask Dr. Vikas a question. Uh, how, how often do you uh, tack, uh, I mean, uh, see antifungal resistance in your clinical practice and how do you tackle, tackle it? Uh, well, first I would like to thank the organizers, especially the Anti AMR uh, Decreation Trust, uh, Dr. Abdul Ghafoor and Dr. Nitin Bazal and Dr. Ashmit Are for giving opportunity to speak here and be on this, uh, among this August uh, audience. It's always a pleasure listening to Dr. Chakravarti and we miss him in the morning academics. So coming back to your question, actually, uh, firstly, we have to uh, uh, identify why this resistance occurs. Sir has already talked about it's a lack of knowledge, inappropriate use and recent COVID experience has told us that the inappropriate use of steroids led to the emergence of, 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 of mucor. So in a, in a summary, I would say that that in practice, the increased anti antifungal resistance leads to increase uh, cost of treatment because all of these generally patients are in ICU are admitted patients so they will lead to uh, uh, increased cost of treatment uh, it leads to inappropriate use of antifungals irrational both in in type and dose uh, we have seen a lot of irrational doses of antifungals been used and thus it pro probably leads to more resistance and a potential uh, there's a role of toxicity so uh, I agree with Dr. Uh, with Professor Chakravarti that we need uh, newer antifungals and we need to probably do some innovation in the already, uh, we have only four antifungals. There is some data for use of combination antifungals. There is some data about immunotherapy. Uh, it's a recent thing like we have seen a recent article in, in, in energy about immunotherapy in malaria. Uh, there is a recent article in energy about increased dose of, of amphotericin in crypto. So we, we have to do innovation with these four drugs till we have those because the two drugs which are available, the newer antifungal, the Brexa and Isovanacol, they are a little costly at this moment. And uh, uh, then we have to do the drug testing. So we have to use them very judicially as other, and otherwise they will probably lead to the same uh, fate as the other ones. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And thank you uh, for making up to the conference at such a short notice. Uh, we have come to the end of the scientific sessions. I will hand over the mic to Dr. Vasant sir and Yamuna madam for vote of thanks. Uh, thanks, Dr. Nitin. Uh, I think it's been a wonderful feast right from 2 p.m. till almost 7 p.m. in five hours. And I tell you, not a single minute was, you know, uh, every every sentence was so important in this, uh, the whole, you know, uh, seminar which we went to. All of us are convinced that we need new weapons in our armamentarium against the drug resistant bacteria, mycobacteria, mycobacteria and fungi. We believe the first webinar of secret plans to tame the superbugs by the AMR Declaration Trust will help the medical community and other stakeholders realize the global antimicrobial resistance scenario and the need to for collective and urgent action. We will distribute the link to the, for the recorded version of the webinar so that those who could not attend the webinar today can also listen to the talks. We express sincere thanks to all the speakers and panelists. We are also grateful to the doctors who gave their small donation to the trust and the pharmaceutical companies who have offered a small and restrictive grants for the webinar so that we can conduct the webinar without any registration fees. And the last, I would say thanks to Dr. Gafur, who was the main person, key person, single-handedly, who has taken the you know complete uh, responsibility on his shoulder. I hand over to Yamuna for the further comments. 
Thank you, sir. I would like to uh, thank all the participants, the panelists, the speakers at the behest of our heart. Uh, it was really a wonderful initiative which uh, AMR Trust has taken. And uh, by this lecture on this entire web series, we have, we have understood that uh, uh, AMR uh, is a global challenge and India is also facing this cha same challenge currently. But this webinar has definitely convinced all of us and it's an eye opener to all of us that as a country, India is intellectually as well as scientifically very strong enough. And we want to promise to all the people and participants right now that the AMR Trust will take it forward to collaborate scientific people and also all other stakeholders uh, uh, along with the clinical team to, in order to find out new revolutions and new innovations in the field of antimicrobial resistance so that our future generation will be benefited. Thank you one and all for participating in the webinar. Thank you so much.